Another uh, wonderful stream. It is going to be the Tau Faction tier list. It's been a long time in the making. Honestly, Arcs of Omen has, um, in my opinion, changed Tau quite dramatically from the previous one uh, in how the army plays and what units are viable. Yep. Um, some of the classics are still there, but uh, some of the other ones are dramatically improved. And I've been testing a lot of Tau builds, and uh, I just played them in the Streamhouse RTT. You can check those games out in the War Room, but uh, I believe there's at least four Tau games, and if you like Tau games, uh, you're going to hopefully enjoy those ones absolutely now this is going to be a tier list focusing specifically on um kind of if you were going to take tau to a gt or a tournament whatever it is what are the best units to take and why are they good so jack and i are going to break down exactly why um you know a particular unit is actually useful how it fits into the overall army archetype and then how it compares to other similar options so we're going to be doing all of that uh in this tier list and on top of that, if you like this content, if you want more of it, please click subscribe to our YouTube channel. Go ahead and leave a comment below. Uh, we love uh, seeing all the comments. If you have any feedback for us, if you disagree with any of the choices at the end of this, please let us know in the comments. It all really helps that YouTube algorithm. And finally, if you want to see all that Tau content that is in the War Room, um, including the games from the Streamhouse RTT, click the description below, thewarroom.vhx.tv, and there's a three-day free trial. Check it out. Um, you can watch tons and tons of Tau stuff, uh, pretty much. I've done maybe, you know, like 12 plus different Arcs of Omen Tau content pieces, and this week I'm doing a Streamhouse RTT recap, going through my different games, as well as um, kind of where I'm going with Tau after this one. So. Sounds good. Now, everybody knows that you play Tau Seeks. Everyone knows you're a Tau, Tau head. Been playing them since 8th uh, edition. That's right. Uh, but what people might not know is that I also know my Tau. Uh, you I, really do. I was the uh, Team America WTC Tau player when we went and represented America overseas. So. Jack, Jack took the Tau from me. He was like, no, banish to the Admech. <laughs> <laughs> you went off to play with your lad's chickens or whatever, and I was like, all right, I'm going to move fast. I'm going to shoot people. And then I moved fast and I shot people. Also took them to several uh, tournaments last year. Including Cherokee. Including Cherokee, which I managed to take down with the uh, Tau on release, basically. <laughs> I gave Tau, I gave a Jack a Tau list, and then he was like, all right, I like this. I'm going to go back. I'm going to come up with something. And then he came back the next day and was like, here, check out this list. And it was my list. <laughs> it was close. It, <laughs> it was, was like not points. the same list. <laughs> it was like 20 points. Different. It was not. <laughs> it was very. It was different in subtle little... It was different, okay? <laughs> That's the point I think that needs to be made. <laughs> but uh, it performed well, right? Farsight Enclaves, Airburst. Sure People were poo-pooing my Airburst ideas, and guess what? It was no. amazing. It got to get nerfed. Yeah, it was It was very good. Double Airburst, Tau Flamer. Whew, that was a strong unit. So we haven't done one of these uh, Tau tier lists in a little bit, but I think it's it's uh, Tau is one of the factions that changed quite a bit in Arcs of Omen, so I think it's worth going back to these. That's right. That's right. Okay, doke. So the biggest things that changed in my mind are commanders. You're now locked to two. There's no way around it. Mm -hmm. And planes have to go in reserves. Yeah. Uh, let's actually just stay on this scene for a little bit as you kind of give a synopsis of where Tau is transitioned. Absolutely. So their secondary, everyone's secondaries kind of came down somewhat. Uh, Tau's were never that good, but uh, stayed where they were at least. So the difference in terms of uh, secondaries has narrowed. It is not even. So Tau still have to get fairly aggressive, I think. Uh, commanders used to be able to take one per detachment, and then you could take... Uh, the one who's really going to hurt here is Shadow Sun. Uh, you could take yeah. Shadow Sun in a sec separate detachment, or Farsight Enclaves would let you take two in each detachment. So you could take four commanders in two detachments. Uh, you can't do that anymore. Because nope. the... Uh, what, what is it? The heroic support stratagem? Yep. 
specifies if you can take one of something in the detachment, you can now take two. So it doesn't say one additional. Right. So Farsight Enclaves, if it said one additional, they could take two and then add a third one. But, uh, but they wrote it in that yeah. way. And then there's no exempt from, exemption for Supreme Commander. Exactly. She, Shadow Sun still counts as a commander data sheet, and you can only ever take two, but, even with heroic support. In my mind, is very restrictive for Tau. I think that's probably the biggest change. Uh, because before, Farsight Enclaves lists would be all about the commanders, and now Farsight Enclaves is two. So figure that out. <laughs> um, it's still good. It's still good. Uh, the planes having to go in reserves is fine, as we'll discuss. Uh, how did you feel about your planes at uh, in the RTT? I was never somebody who really enjoyed the, I'm going to go cripple my opponent turn one and then just have an easy street game after that. That's not why I play 40k. I want to have a back and forth interactive game with my opponent. And I think Tau actually plays that style really well now. Um, and Sunshark Bombers getting nerfed is part of that. Yeah. I think the Sunshark is still a good fire support platform, but in terms of I cripple my opponent turn one, you're not really being able to do that no. anymore. No. And the key is, I think at a higher level play, what I was doing, because I think the first time one of our lists really had Sunsharks in it was the list that we as a group crafted for uh, WTC when uh, I took it. I actually uh, was uh, doing during the summer. I was uh, uh. dropping some bombs on, on people. Oh. Specifically Nick. This was this is a long period of time where John refused to play against Tao. <laughs> but what I discovered, well, he was forced to, to prep for WTC. To. <laughs> uh, what I discovered after playing it is that you almost never turn one want to just rush your opponent and shoot them with planes. What you almost always wanted to do was bomb them, fly off the board, and then turn two, come back on, shoot some stuff, Turn three, try to get that overwhelming, like, crisis suits hit you, commanders, commanders, plane, plane, and uh, trying to end the game there. But trying to end the game turn one was premature, and your opponent would have enough stuff left that they would be able to respond. Except for Farsight Enclaves, because I was somebody who loved running the home and beacon with stealth suits, and I would bring in my crisis unit, redeploy the big unit on the table, move it the 18 inches, bring down the unit from reserve, the two planes are there, and usually that was enough to do a ton of damage especially depending on mission like the table it was quarters a very missions. it's a very strong alpha depending on the mission i'm assuming like i generally assume that like wtc caliber players would have something in their list to deal with that or have like whatever list they're throwing into tau is going to be able to try and stop the turn one but the turn three is a lot tougher exactly it's because they have to trade resources to slow you down and then they don't they run out of screens like and turn then, three. And you're <laughs> like all right turn three everything's <laughs> hitting you you cannot stop it at this point plane plane commander commander crisis suit crisis suit and just blah. so the army is different now and it's if you watch any now. of the streamhouse rtt games um pretty much you're dominated by a cal young late game style in my opinion where you're taking decisive action you're taking raise the banners or one of the action secondaries like aerospace i really avoid retreat battlefield data um but you could yeah. potentially design a list to take it and then the third one is just that's the hard part is it you have to take usually some sort of kill secondary, which means you need to force the pressure onto your opponent. But I think yes. Tau do that pretty well. They, they do. Now, I'm going to be a little bit off here, and I still think there's a place for Montka. The biggest, the biggest downside is obviously uh, decisive action. It's decisive action downside. having to proc turns one, two, and three. But I think when you look at your opponent's list and you go, listen, you're going to get tabled by turn three. I am forcing this to happen. You have no say in it. Um then I think you probably want to be Montka. So you can go further, shoot fat, shoot farther, but more importantly, like your planes reroll ones to wound, your crisis suits reroll ones to wound, like on turn two or three when you really start to apply the damage. Is it a risky pick? 100%. Absolutely. But I, I, what I hate about Kalyan is that it procs like as the game is wrapping, and so it's a lot less impactful, even though it has like a selection of some of the most broken rules in the game. See, I think it's the reverse. I think any good list nowadays should have the resources to try and delay you the first two turns, in which case you're only getting the last part of Monkar, really, and then Kalyan kicks in. And I think Kalyan being able to fall back and shoot um, just period on your army is very, very powerful because it means that your opponent trying to tag and slow things down doesn't have quite an easy opportunity. And there are some lists that don't even run a Crisis Commander, which I disagree with, obviously. Yeah. But... Uh, they, you need Kalyan in that situation. But the exploding attacks, I found that it's not necessarily that, that like first or second wave of your units that needs it, but it's that end game when you have the two commanders that I like to run, the two, uh, the Precision yeah. or Secret Perfection commander. They get absurdly stronger with Kalyan and they can just pick do. up units. So yeah. 
I, th- um, I think what it comes down to is whether you're going to utilize turn two of Montka very effectively. Because if you're going to utilize turn two and three, and you're playing to make it like a, a an early game, like an early turns game, then it probably outweighs having turn three of Kalyon. But if it's if you're not really going to be able to utilize turn two, and that comes from experience, whether you know whether that's going to happen, then turns three and four of Kalyon are just better. And yes, yep. turn three of Kalyon is better than turn three of Montka. Yep. So. I agree. It mostly comes down to how fast can you can you put the pressure on people. Exactly. And if your opponent has no screens and you're able to and there's angles on your boards, I'm not against it. But once you're playing on heavier terrain, once you're playing against a list that can move block and, and stop you from going into s- scary positions, then I just prefer yeah. Kalyon. And I, I think at most it's going to be seventy five percent of the time you take Kalyon. I mean not not at like at most it's gonna be twenty five percent of the time you pick Monka, but I don't want it to just be a default that people pick, like, oh of course it's Kalyon. Well, Think about it. It's a strong set of rules that you can choose to have. Think about it. Then probably go Kalyon. But yeah. <laughs> you have you always have the opportunity to be like, I'm going first. Montka. Boom. <laughs> so let's go ahead and dive into here on the tier list. Let's do it. So we've gone ahead and did some uh, some rearranging of the tiers. I'm going to explain them in a second. But uh, at the top, we have Shazo favorites. This used to be uh, kind of tournament staples. But this is going to be your units where they're, they're bread and butter of your army. You're going to have these units. You're going to rely on them. They're your main damage dealers. They're your main utility pieces. They're in most lists. And they, they do their uh, role supremely well. Then promotion to Shazel is going to be stuff that it's competitive. It's very solid. Um, you don't see it in every single list, but more often than not, it's just a very good tool for what yeah. you're trying to get. It's a strong. I mean, it's a strong unit. You can bring. It will not let you down. It will perform the role you want it to. It's a good unit. It's a good unit. Reliable rank and file. This is where this is an average unit. It probably is on the more niche side of things in that. If you're building a specific list to do a specific thing, this probably fits in. Or maybe it's a single tech piece that you want to bring for a specific meta. But if you're not playing in that meta, you don't really need it. This is just your solid. It it probably could use a little bit of a buff. And it's probably competing with other units that fill a similar role. But it's not bad. It's not bad. Yeah, this is the... Yeah, it's fine. It's It's okay. Not bad. It's okay. Yeah, you could run this to, you know, random RTT and still use it fine. I, I think the way to think of these top three is we will... Root, like the core of our lists will be built around things in the top two tiers, mm-hmm. and then occasionally we'll dip into reliable rank and file to pull units out. Yep. But we're generally not going to base lists around units in reliable rank and file or pull units from Firecast Disappointment. Yep. Which is the next tier, Firecast Disappointment. These these units need a buff. They're, they've been bad for a while, and they're going to continue to be bad. <laughs> so you just rarely ever see them, and they're just they're competing with other units, and they don't really do their own role very well. Yeah, there's something that prevents these units from doing what they need to do. There's some issue. Maybe they're overpriced. Maybe their rules don't actually work the way they need to. Maybe they just don't have any offense or defense to speak of. Like Something's holding them back. Yep. And then finally, uh, Scapegoat for Onva's Death. These units just, they're so bad that the tower just cannot even look at them. Yeah, like why do these exist <laughs> is is the question that should go through your mind anytime we put something in there. And there's going to be a couple units that fit down here, um, <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> that you just don't see. So yeah. we're going to do them, all the, t- all the different uh, units in order. So they're going to follow the codex order and the battlefield roll order. So uh, That's right. we're going to go through the HQs first, then the troops, then the elites, fast attack, so on and so forth. And at the end is going to be the forge roll data sheets. Yep. Okay. Let's uh, let's start with these HQs. HQs are the coolest. Um, they're the most fun part of every Tau list, for sure. I have been the biggest fan of Commanders since that Commander uh, kit came out. Love all Commanders. Just, yep. I'm a huge fan of every Commander, um, even Shadow Sun, even though she's my least favorite. <laughs> I've been playing the uh, the four Commander list, right? I not can't do that anymore, obviously, but I had been after WTC, after seeing uh, Team Australia's list that had triple Cold Star. Thought it was very strong. Mm-hmm. Like, Commanders are fun. They're so fun. <laughs> the bottom tier should be outcast. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like Skate Go for Hoppa's death, but that's a good one too. Yeah. So Shadow Sun, 
she we mentioned um how the commander change with heroic support has made her where she is now one of the two commanders you can take it really hurt her it really does hurt her so what does she give you first of all she is chapter master for tau yeah and she gives reroll ones uh, because she's a commander to yep. your core units very solid rules she can forward deploy not that critical but it was cool when you had exemplar of the Kalyan and could just kind of push back their forward deployers and then bring her back yeah i did that all the time sometimes it would just be to uh you know establish dominance i just deploy her <laughs> nine inches from my opponent's <laughs> deployment zone and i'd say what up what up and then because that. <laughs> <laughs> that's back when i had to take her warlord trait and yep. okay it could only apply to herself cool uh, she's got extended auras, um, not only from Tauset, but from the uh, special drone that she brings. So she's very easy to get. It's very easy to get in range of her buffs. Yeah, and it's been a second, but I believe she can't be shot from more than like 12 inches away unless she's the closest. Closest eligible. So it's you, you get some cute positioning there. Mm -hmm. She has some guns. She has the high energy uh, fusion blasters, which are basically just 24 inch fusion blasters. Yep. And then a light missile pod. Light missile pod Lightest and a flechette blaster, which mm -hmm. people always accuse me of making up. It, 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 it is there. <laughs> Occasionally, you the chip the last it. wound off of something, and people will be like. Well, funnily enough, the flechette blaster, when uh, Old Monkai existed with the extra AP, was actually not bad. <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't bad. You'd be like, "All right, here, take some AP but ones," and they're like, just when they thought they were done. It's a pistol profile, right? So you can't fire it with the rest of the guns. <laughs> um, I thought it was assault or something. It might be assault. I think it might have used to been pistol, but that's that shows you how many times I fired the flechette blaster. <laughs> yep, it's assault. So yeah, it's assault. It used to go to strength three AP one. <laughs> it, it was not bad in old uh, Montca because yep. you would shoot at things that were toughness three, and ordinarily she had no business clearing a unit that's toughness three. Yep. But between shooting and fighting, she would actually kill it. Yeah, she's she's not a bad commander by herself. She doesn't compare to the Seeker Perfection Borkon commander. She doesn't compare to Precision of the Hunter. She just doesn't have weapons as good as that. But she's okay in damage. Output. Yeah. So her role is support. She. Yep does okay damage. She does fine damage, right? She has her reroll to wound. She, you know, or to hit, I guess, on her on her uh, fusions, mm -hmm. which means that she's a decent tank killer. Like, she would run around in my games and just be like, all right, you take, you know, 2d6 plus 4 damage. You take 2d6 yeah, plus 4 damage. And her fusions damage, are 24 inches instead of 18. Which helps so much for keeping her safe. Um, so sh her damage is fine, it's fine, especially for 150 points. It's fine. Yep. But it's not great. It's not great. Her main, the main reason you take her is because she gives a crisis unit reroll hits, which is not something you get anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And I honestly think for their price, crisis suits have a damage output problem. They, they hit hard, mm -hmm. but then they cost like 600 points. So you need to make sure your 600 point unit actually just goes, all right, no, I'm done with this. You're dead. You know, like there's there's no ifs, ands, or buts, you're gone. Mm -hmm. Um, which especially helps in places where you don't have marker lights. Yep. So things like airburst fragmentation projectors, which reduce your ballistic skill, those you definitely want to have Shadow Sun. If you're making an airburst unit, you in my mind basically need Shadow Sun and Long Strike. Yep, to you make that you unit have to play effective. it in Tau and that's really where we only see it anyway. Yeah. Um, so Shadow Sun really amps the damage of your units. It used to be cool to take her because you could take her in her Supreme Command so you would get around having to include a whole nother detachment for her and she didn't need any Warlord traits or relics so that was cool. You didn't need to spend anything. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not the case anymore. You only get an Arcs of Omen detachment. You do not get Shadow Sun. So where are you feeling for Shadow Sun, <sighs> Mr. Jack? I still think she's strong. She has. I keep wanting to put her in my tell lists. That I'm building, but I don't think she is Shasso's favorites anymore if she ever was. I think she was at one point. She was at one point yeah. in Shasso's favorites, but I think I would put her in uh Yeah. In, yeah I think she's not she's not mandatory anymore because she doesn't easily fit into the list. You were sacrificing a Crisis Commander or a Cold Star. And, and realistically it's the Cold Star. It's the Cold Star, so you're taking Crisis Commander and Shadow Sun, which is fine. It's fine. But at the same time, that Cold Star is so good for getting aerospace points, for forcing opponent screening, for just killing things. Yeah. It, it's tough to, to give that up. Yeah, you're losing damage in exchange for just amping the reliability of your crisis suit units, which is worthwhile to the point where I want to take her often. The other thing but is, it hurts. The other thing is, even in Tau Sept, you can just be like, Long Strike gives the unit the marker light, you're rerolling ones to hit, and it's not the end of the world that you're not rerolling twos. Yeah. So. Yeah, I... 
I don't know. Every time I don't take, every time I don't take her, it's just twos for days. Twos for days. Nothing twos for twos. days. <laughs> All right. Uh, moving on to uh, Commander Farsight here. He ha- He is getting an updated model. He uh, is. It's sweet. It is amazingly sweet. So he finally has a base size that uh, and a sword that you know fits that you would just easily see him chopping off Eight Weaver's head with. <laughs> but uh, his rules are uh, the same as 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 we've seen. So. I'm going to just go through these ones in the Codex. So first of all, he actually hits hard in combat. He does. He's got five swings. They're high damage. I believe strain 10, AP 3, 3 damage, which that's that's quite, quite solid. That's and then he has good. a sweep profile. So if you try and tag you know, a unit, um, you know, he can just come in and just cleave through them. It's uh, it's only one damage on his sweep profiles, which is, I think, where most sweep profiles should, sweep profiles should be. Uh, an AP 2 and strain 6. So it's, it's not bad. It can finish off a lot of chaff. Yeah, I think... And he hits on twos. Having... Having units that hit in combat is important for Tau, which is basically why Farsight exists, because there's no reason for it to exist past being a cheap Crisis Commander. Yep, so in addition, he is a Crisis Commander, which means that um, he has access to the fallback shoot and charge rule for your Crisis Core unit, as well as ignore all hit modifiers. That is, in my opinion, the strongest buff for Crisis Suits. It is. And it's pretty essential, in my opinion. So, What would have happened in our game if I could have given you minus two to hit and it would have stuck? I mean, it, I would have had to hit with marker lights so that I would just be crying. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> yeah. So, like, you get around all of that. I can make you, you can be shooting through a forest. I can be lightning fast reactions, shooting at a Star Weaver... Uh, yeah. After you advanced without the cold star for some reason, and or no, the cold star doesn't give any the cold star doesn't penalties. only it's, the strat does. It's uh yeah, it's the strat, the sixteen inch move. It could be minus four, and you just ignore all of that. All right, hit on threes now with the marker light. It's pretty critical for an army that has um you know it, your crisis unit is your main damage dealer. You need it to reliably hit, like Jack has mentioned with yep. Shadow Sun. The crisis buff is critical to that. Um, there's dense cover, whether it's um, WTC format, R format. Um, player place terrain often has a lot of dense pieces. Minus one to hit is just brutal for Tau, and being able to get around it is huge. Yeah, minus one to hit offsets the marker light, but really you need the marker light in order to be anywhere combat effective. Like, you need to have plus one to hit on your army. So if that goes away, suddenly you're in real, un- like a real annoying spot. But then if your opponent has some kind of access to minus two, you commit your crisis, they hit on fives. That's rough. That's really, really rough. And so having a crisis buff to get around that feels essential for both of us. Every so often we see lists popping out of the woodwork that have cut their crisis commander and they're like, ah, we take Kalyon. We fall back, shoot, and charge on turns three, four, and five. Not to mention the fact that you lose the game if you get tagged on turn two, but whatever. (laughs) Um, You just need to ignore hit modifiers because otherwise they're brutal on a ballistical four army. Yep. 100% 100% agree there. Um, on top of that, he has a 4-up invuln from his shield generator, and his warlord trait, the one that he has to take, is Exemplar of the Monka, which is reroll wound rolls. It's 12 inches if you pick Monka, or 9 inches if you pick Kalyan, which it just means if your opponent, if you and get within 9 inches, you're also rerolling wounds against uh, that closest, those closest units. Yep. So powerful, so, so so powerful. Good. All those durable units. Um, now reroll wounds fell away a little bit when Votan came out because they just ignore that. But honestly, um, Votan received several nerfs, and you're not really tailoring for them uh, in any way with Tau. That sounds right. So with Monka, um, you know, 12 inches is really tasty, but nine inches still isn't that bad. Yeah. Honestly, the biggest reason to go Monka for me is it's just so much easier to get within 12 than within nine. Yep. It's my theory, you can let me know if you agree, that I think you need some form of rerolls on your Tau. Whether that is Shadow Sun or Exemplar of the Monka, you need one of the two, uh, I think, to really reliably do damage to targets. Because otherwise, you know, you're at the mercy of the threes to wound. And we all know threes to wound are fickle. I, I don't think so. I think that if you, uh, I think that is one way. If you're going for pure damage and you're cutting a lot of the um, cheap resources that Tau has, then I 100% agree. I think, however, that Tau has a really amazing move blocking tools and can slow down units uh, from getting into positions where you have to kill them immediately. Yeah. And that way you can ship away at them. So um, I think obviously Borkon is the one sept that wants to play a bit farther back and doesn't really want to play Exemplar. But Farsight Enclaves, 100% I would take Exemplar yeah. of the Monka. And Tau Sept, it's 
you still want it, but it's a little bit harder with if you take Shadow Sun. Yeah, Borkon's looking to operate at that 22 inch range, so I, I agree there. I totally get why it didn't appear in your in your RTT list. Yep. Borkon wants to shoot at 22; they if, don't want to shoot at nine. If I take Farsight Enclaves, 100, percent I'm taking it. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, you're definitely taking. If I play Tau Sept or I play Farsight Enclaves, I'm taking Exemplar of the Monka. Um, That's fair. But now let's, let's get back to Farsight. He's what 130? 130 points uh, in Farsight Enclaves. I think he's automatic. He, uh, yeah. He becomes the the guy. He, he's your crisis yeah. commander. So he does significantly less damage than a crisis commander. So it'd yep. basically be him plus a cold star, and the cold star gets precision of the hunter. And I'm I'm totally fine with that. Like yep. I don't. That's great. But he's so cheap. He's, he is, he's you're saving yeah. about 70, 75 points from a loaded up uh, crisis commander, and he actually has uh, combat to speak of, so yep. he can charge onto objectives and be very annoying that way. He also gives your crisis unit plus one to hit in combat, which uh, shouldn't be undervalued, Mister Jack. <laughs> way of the short blade <laughs> but uh it is the most it is the least powerful yeah. buff he has he helps out substantially in the knights matchup in the chaos knights matchup um just because they don't have that involving in combat uh and he can run in there because we've all exp i experienced it at wtc you experienced it recently shooting phases can flop and they do all the time um mm -hmm. but having a second phase where you're like all right here's five attacks and I'm going to re-roll a wound, and you get a 6-up save, and they're damage 3. Like, this can just kill an Armager by itself. But realistically, if there's one that's left at half health, he goes in, cleans it up every time, yep. moves on with his life. Between him and the Precision, or sorry, the Thermoneutronic Projector uh, Commander, you have two reliable combat units. And they hit hard enough that your opponent ties up on you. You're like, all right, I'll shoot all this other stuff, and you die in combat. And the great thing about that is that you get to use your opponent's charges for mobility on the rest of your units, and then you get to kill them yeah. in combat. So what he's talking about is it's a, it's a pretty high-level technique mm -hmm. where your opponent presents you a unit. Maybe they got it from behind enemy lines or contesting an objective or whatever. You... You charge it with Farsight, and you charge it with, like, the rest of your army. Mm -hmm. And Farsight cuts their head off, no questions asked. Maybe they're Fate Weaver, who can say? <laughs> and then the rest of your army gets to pile in and consolidate and just get extra movement up board. And then the following turn, your opponent's like, oh, my God, they can go 18 and shoot me now. Yep. <laughs> Exactly. So maybe a move block that they had set up now doesn't work anymore because of one of the plays that they yeah. made. You've convinced me. I mean, I didn't need to be convinced. I really like the double melee commander that Bo that that shoots. He is cheap, so you get a bunch of extra stuff out of it. And he hits hard in combat with him. And you can even take an Onager Gauntlet on the other guy. Probably yep. wouldn't, but you can. And then knights get just wrecked in yep. combat. You totally could. Uh, I went for de defensive relics on my commanders, but I could have went for the, the Gauntlet. Uh, instead yeah that's a viable choice but the fact he can he really helps with knights he really helps with things like that vehicles i think the the major thing here is that he actually has a crisis core buff and that is the strongest one which is the yeah. crisis commander and that is why i think if you're taking farsight enclaves he's auto yeah if he didn't have that like shadow sun doesn't he'd be probably down to reliable rank and file honestly probably because he doesn't he doesn't fill that role that you need before you can even get your foot in the door of like i'm one other stuff Okay, so uh, the Crisis Commander, I need to go grab that uh, little friend here. So we're going to do go through each of the three commanders here. Yep. So let's uh, just start with this one here, which is the Cold Star Commander. The Cold Star Commander is outstanding. He is uh, extremely fast. He moves 14 inches, yep. and he has a once-per-game teleport. That's so good. It is it's ludicrous. so good. <laughs> so just having this model forces your opponent to screen. Yep. Because he's just going to show up in Borkon. He's ridiculous with Seeker of Perfection because yeah. he's extra AP on all of his weapons. And you got the high output burst, you got the advanced burst cannon, you got a regular burst cannon, and some other weapon, whatever you yeah. choose. You, your loadout is up to you. It's My preferred one is the high output, the DW02, and double Tau Flamers. Because yep. on Overwatch, he's just vicious. He's just he's vicious anyway. He's vicious. He, he's just straight up general. vicious. Um, uh, that guy looks to probably play eleven inches away from you and use the uh, overdrive power systems along with seeker perfection. Your guy is a little bit more standoff, a little bit safer, but will get you every single turn yep. with um, and with I, what a missile pod and a burst cannon. He, yeah, he's a regular burst cannon and a missile yeah. pod. But if you wanted to get up close and personal, and that's maybe where you take the Honor Gauntlet as the relic instead, so he could just punch through a couple extra uh, bits of damage, uh, I don't mind any of that. But yeah. Overdrive um, is also great. That's the Borkon relic where you pick two weapons. If you're in half range, you get plus one to wound. Yeah. 
Great. DWO2 and the, uh, high, the high output, output burst all going to AP2, AP3 if you coordinate engagement, ignores cover, plus one to wound, doing mortals on sixes. Then you have the flamers backing it up. Yeah, this guy has target lock inbuilt. Doesn't count as one of his weapon systems, just ignore so cover. Good. It's so, so good. good. But uh, in addition, he also picks a crisis core unit and they flat advance eight which means your crisis unit can move 18 inches and then shoot. God, now I'm sad I submitted Custodius to Scrims. This guy <laughs> is play this outstanding. Guy. It's um, so good. Great for your secondary play because with aerospace, he's one of those things. He's infantry, so he can just fly over and uh, finish it off late game. But the threat of him always teleporting, forcing the screening, there's a real power in that for Tau. Tau want to get those opponents' cheap resources out into the open so they can die in the early game and they don't have to worry about him late game. Yes. He is outstanding. Um, I... Yep. I think that he's the second best commander after the Crisis Commander. After the Crisis. Because the Crisis buff you just need. But I do think that he's that second commander that flot, uh, slots in, whether it's Farsight Enclaves, Tau Sept, or uh, Borkon, or any of the other yeah. Septs. He's, it's so good. The mobility, the shooting platform, the mobility on it, the teleport, the fact that you make your guys move 18, it's just, he's not that expensive, right? It all synergizes, and it's all amazing. Um the Cold Star is great. I was running three of them in Farsight Enclaves before that became not a thing. I they were so good. They were the centerpiece of the list, honestly. Yeah. And they were they were quite solid. And, and you can make a good Cold Star commander outside of Borkon too. Not quite as good as Borkon, but pretty pretty dang good. Still pretty good in Farsight Enclaves. You can take um, the uh, Master, Master of the Killing Blow, yep. so that six to wound or three additional AP. On top of that, it ignores face caps and feel no pains, so you can just rip through units that rely yep. on such rules like that face cap bloodthirster. It's you, the easiest way for Tau to kill that bloodthirster. You can always take uh, Precision of the Hunter on him, and he will he's very good really as a Precision of the Hunter uh, caddy. Mm -hmm. Very, very strong at Precision of the Hunter, just with the massive, massive amount of shots output. Like, I took this guy, when I took this guy to WTC, he just slayed. He would just cut... He slayed. He slayed, Queen. <laughs> It just cut units in half. <laughs> just brrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
I agree with all that. All right, uh, moving on to the last of the generic commanders. This is the Enforcer Commander. So the Enforcer Commander, I, in my opinion, was hurt the most by the, com the change to um, how you access commanders with heroic support because he was always that third commander I add in for Farsight Enclaves, and it gave me obsec late game on my crisis units, which is really powerful when they're bullying the board and also obsec, so it's hard to contest the objectives back. So the reason, his big buff is, like I said, he gives out obsec to a crisis core unit. He still gives reroll ones, and then he is the most defensive of the commanders. He has an inbuilt two up, and he also has minus one damage. Yeah, he's and got, he has an extra wound up to seven. He's got seven wounds, same as the cold star, and you give him uh, the Miguel Hunter's Plate, so he sits on a one-up, five of Fiona Pain, there's two drones in his unit. He's a tank. I loved giving him Thermo Neutronic Projector. You could give him the Onager Gauntlet as well, but he hits pretty hard in combat and would just beat so many things to death while also yeah. tanking tons of damage. Yeah, I don't think you need Onager Gauntlet as you didn't take it most of the time. Yeah. Thermo with rerolls is enough, and him with, uh, with Miguel Hunter's Plate is just impossible to kill yeah there was a stream game i played against nick's craft worlds where I, I rushed him down and the enforcer and the other commander basically were dominant in the late game i think i got like 13 points on assassinate by the cold the uh, enforcer commander alone just punching out eldar characters and shooting them away yeah how are you supposed to deal with this guy when he's operating 22 inches away from you or 20 or 18 inches away from you and just shooting right because he goes to a place and then every enemy dies and then your opponent needs to bring something from out of range to come kill him. Mm -hmm. And it's just not going to work. Plus, you have an interrupt that's credible on him, rerolling yep. hits and wounds as he does. Yep. His, ro his heroic nuts. matter, him and Farsight, I used to do, where they both be on the center of objectives and can just heroic any contesting unit. So there's power there. He does move two inches uh, slower than the yes. other command. And than, he does uh, not dynamic command. offensive. And he doesn't dynamic offensive, but he's still infantry, so he benefits from cover. So he can take him to a zero up save <laughs> 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 with, with Miguel Hunter's plate just standing on terrain. Just standing in the open be like, what, what about it? huh <laughs> yeah i think this one you're definitely right this one suffers the most from the from the change because he was as you said always the third one he's super cool he's probably not making the cut over the other two because like the cold star moves a solid six inches further mm -hmm. and teleports once a game and that is a level of mobility that means it's probably going to shoot like an extra time over the course of the game or more much harder to stop so the enforcer can be delayed like he's more of a control piece he's a control piece and i you know i love the control style. i know you love the control style we, and you know i love hyper durable damaging characters that run yeah. around doing nonsense uh but i think he doesn't actually fit in my builds i think the one place he does actually fit is in Sasea. and the reason is is because they have a warlord trait to give out obsec to any core unit and then you have him giving out obsec so a crisis brick can be double obsec and the drones are obsec from the Sasea warlord trait that is a very difficult thing to deal with if you're focusing on just trying to control the primary of a game. And I think that's the one place I would actually take him over the Cold Star. Yeah. I think in Borkan you can consider it, but it's I, it's I did miss him. I did miss not having him. Yeah. But did anyone make an assassination run on your Crisis Commander? Not in terms of his durability, in terms of giving the Crisis unit Fair. OPSEC. Yeah. No, that, that definitely was uh, would have been nice in multiple games. Yep. Yeah. So. But you can't lose out on the buffs you have. Like, moving 18 was essential yep. you know having ignoring hit penalties and falling back like if you didn't fall back and shoot i would have tied you up turns one well, and I'm, turn two yeah i'm taking the crisis commander exactly it's the second like, it's the second commander the crisis commander is non-negotiable just take the crisis commander right. please what i'm saying is this guy suffers by comparison yep because like you can't cut the crisis commander so then he has to compete with a cold star and the cold star i think edges him out yeah i do think that uh being able to make your crisis you an obsec throughout the game to make primary denial plays hard and then to control primary in the late game is very strong it just is it worth uh, giving up the cold star is the question probably not but i think there are some builds like to say where i would do it sounds good yeah okay. it's very good it's just the slots are a problem you might be wondering why we're spending so much time on the commanders these are one of the key units for this entire army and how it functions yes is why. yeah so we won't spend like a ton of time on every single data sheet here but it's worth it for the commanders because they're so critical to how the army functions yeah Okay. All right. Well, that is the commanders. We got a couple more HQs here. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, who is yeah. next? The Codger we had uh, we had Nick have a brief question there. How would you kit out a cold star for a far side on clays? Probably precision the hunter, thermonutronic projector, high output burst, regular burst, some 
thing of your choice and then solid image projector. Yep. And then you cannot fire and fade after deep striking. You can't make another move after you uh, come in from Correct. reserves. That's uh, in the rulebook FAQ uh, for repositioned and uh, redeployed units. Okay, so Katra Fireblade. This guy, you when you see him, he is a basically a caddy for another Whirler trait, for your third Whirler trait. He's yes. Mostly when you see him, and he often comes with marker drones to, you know, kind of put a couple kind extra down. Do something. He's Usually cheap. in Farset Enclaves, where you can't just take an Ethereal to do the same job. Yep. So he's 50 points, so he's relatively cheap. The two drones make bring him up to 70. He gives, um, he picks a Sept core unit within six, um, and each time that core unit um, makes an attack with a pulse weapon, and this is why it can't affect crisis units. Uh, I get, see. I was about to. I yep, was like, they get a. I know Jack was like leaning over, like, oh. No, there's a reason this doesn't work on crisis suits. <laughs> hit roll of six scores an additional hit. If it did work on crisis suits, he would be straight up automatic in, yeah. in every list. But it only works on um, uh, pulse weapons. And yeah. crisis, unit, crisis models cannot take pulse weapons. But it's a pretty decent buff for your uh, breachers. Yeah, it works on breachers pretty good. Yep. And then uh, site. Target sighted is um, you pick a unit within nine inches. That is a fire warrior team. So that's the strike team, the breacher team, and the pathfinders. And uh, each core model that makes attack rerolls once to hit. Now you're taking commanders, and that's your reroll once to hit. So this is less impactful, and especially because it's in the command phase. So he has to be on the board and not in the devil fish. Yeah, it's less useful. But the other ability is quite quite solid. And he's an cheap. So he's he's not bad at that. Where I envision him is where you're taking two to three units of breachers and fish, which is a viable build. Yep. As a viable build, you do secondaries pretty well, and you also have the option to be like, here you go, here's 30 breachers spilling out, all shooting you with exploding sixes to hit. Yep. I like it best in Farsight Enclaves, where they're Absolutely. also easily getting plus one to hit. Yes. And uh, also want to be taking Mon cost so they get the reroll ones to wound, and you're just putting tons of pressure on your opponent, so you have no problem scoring Mon uh, decisive action early. Yep. That's the one place I like him, and Jack already mentioned, Farsight Enclaves is also the place where you potentially want that third Warlord trait, but can't take an Ethereal. That's right. And so he fits yep. in here. So I think he's best there. Um, in my opinion, he is reliable rank and file. 100%. For that role that you want, he does it well. But outside of that, you're really not seeing him in lists. You're not He's generally not you happy to take a Fireblade. The only time you're happy to is when you're taking 20 to 30 Breachers and Fish. And I think that in Farsight Enclaves is a fine... Is, is a, honestly, it's a good build. Yep. It's a good it's build. Good. Yeah. Okay, moving on to the Crude Shaper. Uh, I'm not sure what Jack's opinion on him is, because uh, we haven't talked about him in a little while. I think he's straight up automatic. I think he's actually one of the best characters in this book. The reason is, is he's a 25 point character that can take the advanced EM Scrambler. And that is a relic that prevents units from coming within 12 inches. This is so critical for Tau, in my opinion, because Demons is one of the hardest matchups for Tau. And it straight up says, Demons, you cannot interact on this flank. You have to focus on this flank. And that flank is going to have crisis units. It's going to have all sorts of nonsense, minus two to charge. It's going to be a pain to deal with, right into the teeth of the Tau guns. So uh, there are other matchups like Grey Knights, Thousand Suns, where they can be teleporting all throughout the game. For GSC. 20, GSC. For 25 points, this guy just shuts down a quarter of the board. Yeah, I wish he were harder to kill. He's very easy to pick out on one turn and then just be able to have deep strike supremacy the rest of the game. I've done it a couple times where like some little nonsense gets through and I'm like, all right, he's dead. All right, cool. The following turn, I'm going to deep strike on you. What I use him, I just sit him behind a room the whole game and that quarter of the board you can't interact with. No. That's how I use him. So he, he's, pre he's pretty good. A CP for it, I don't know, but uh, I would almost certainly include it just for those matchups that are rough because the matchups that are rough for Tau are Demons and GSC and that sort of thing. And reserve there, heavy armies because reserve you run armies. out of screens. Yeah, yeah, you don't have a lot of nonsense. So I, I do think he's very good because he's a very minimal investment to, to help out a lot in those matchups. Yeah. Right now, because of how demons work, I think he is pretty much automatic. Yeah, demons opinion. demons are a rough matchup otherwise. It's because leadership... So your normal screens are like Crute Hounds or Crute and they're leadership five, leadership six. Uh, demons come in, they're like, minus two leadership, and then I'm coming leadership away from you. And you're like, this is a huge problem. This is this is an issue. Uh -huh. Yeah, what you do with him uh, is you, you don't try to project him forward and deny, like, forward. What you do is you put him in the middle of your army where they can't dig him out, and you just say, all right, all your tricks that would let you deep strike, like, in the middle of my army and do weird stuff like that, they don't work. Yeah. Deep strike in front, in front of my screens. You deep strike four inches away from Crute Hounds. I don't care. You get to charge the Crute Hounds, but you don't get to get in to, um, uh, you I, don't get to get into my crisis suits. You don't get to get into my commanders, anything like that. I loved him on the Art of War format because 
on a lot of missions, it was one ruin on one flank, and you just move him into that ruin, he pushed back any sort of reserves coming from there. And on the other side, there was a cargo container formation. And cargo containers are one of those things that a lot of armies struggle to, because you can't charge through them. So I was able to put stealth suits there, minus two to charge on those stealth suits, and just have two flanks that are held down for very cheap. And I love that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I think he's good as an advanced EM scrambler. Him yep. in and of himself, garbage. But the fact <laughs> he's is... He's the cheapest way to raise banners, though, to be fair. Yeah, there's realistically no HQs that can take relics here. If you're taking the Fireblade and he's not riding in a fish to try and buff up... Uh, well, if he's not riding in a fish to buff up Breachers, I think you've messed up somewhere before, like earlier, mm -hmm. uh, in your list construction. But if you have him already in the list as a Warlord Caddy, then sure, give it to him instead. But I think the Crew Shaper, as a 25.1 CP, this is what he does, he's worth it. And the great thing is he can pregame move too, so he has that extra mobility. That's true. All right, uh, moving on to the regular regular Ethereal. <clears throat> so Ethereals have a bunch of rules. First of all, in uh, your command phase, you can pick one of your core units to be able to shoot and do actions, which is very useful on a Crisis yeah. unit. Uh, love that. Um, lets you be able to do decisive action quite easily while still getting your damage out. On top of that, he has an aura, a six-inch aura of you use the leadership of the ethereal, which is ten. That's pretty good. Leadership ten. Uh, this is only on your core units, so it doesn't impact and non-auxiliaries. So it doesn't affect crew, uh, which is where you would want it the most. But it does mean, say for an army like demons, where they're trying to mess with your leadership, you're like, okay, well I start at leadership ten. You can be minus two to this, but then you're minus two to charge. Yes. <laughs> And uh, very, very useful that way. It also just means against things like dread tests, if you're not me, um, you're much more likely to pass them. I roll nothing but 11 pluses on those, so it doesn't matter that I'm leadership 10. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> and, um, I mean, we all have our weaknesses. You and know? then in terms of the powers that he can take, so he knows two different invocations, and he casts one on a three up. But if you take a relic, the humble stave, you know an additional and cast them both on. Uh, I you think can, you sorry, cast you an cast additional two. and it goes off on a two yep, plus. Yep, you cast an additional and it goes off on a two up, so you pick two of them. In my opinion, the best ones are guide, uh, Wisdom of the Guides, yep. which is get one CP. Tau aren't, they don't really need CP a ton. You need your strike and fade, but outside of that, you don't need tons of CP. But having them, you can do a lot of utility combo plays. Yeah, having an extra four on average CP a game is just so worth it. Yep, you're just like, I yeah. can always minus two to charge. Even if it's speculative, even if it's like a six-inch charge for them, makes it an eight, I'm doing it. Yep. And then after that, Sense of Stone. Sense of Stone is the five of Fino Pain. It means that you can soak up a decent amount of mortals with the Crisis unit, and it's just very hard to get through them. Yep. Having on Va, which we'll get to in a second, uh, you get a third one on him, and the one I would take there is... Uh, Zephyr's Grace. Zephyr's Grace, yeah. I, I've never taken it, so I don't... Or I took it, I never used it at WTC, but yeah. Zephyr's Grace is the minus one to hit if they moved, which is very good when you have one unit that needs to not die. Yep. So... So, uh... I quite like the regular theory. It cannot be taken in far side enclaves, um, Sad. unfortunately, but uh, can be taken in the other steps. I think in the other steps, he's he did go up. He's gone up a lot in points. He used he started at what like sixty points. I think he's one oh. I think he's eighty now. One oh five if you take double marker drone and the uh, hover, double marker drone yeah, hover. Yeah, he's one oh five with the with uh, double marker drone hover drone. I believe. No, he's one fifteen with double marker drone because he's ninety points, right? I think he's eighty. I thought he went up to ninety. He's pricey. But uh, what did he start at? I was making a towel list the other day, and uh, it's what not did, too much. What did he start with originally? 60? Yep, he started at 60 points. Yeah, I believe he, he went up to 20, so he a, should be 80. Yep. Um, no, you are correct. He is, he is 90. He's 90 base. That's it. He went up 20 the first time and then went up an additional 10 this last time. Ah. So he is quite pricey. However, if you're... I think, here's how I think about the Ethereal. If I am going to try and damage check my opponent at some point with my Crisis unit, I want that Crisis unit to mostly live or force out every single unit possible so and that I get to And still probably live. And still probably live. So if you're doing that type of play, then I, I do like the Ethereal. Yeah, I like the Ethereal. Uh, him or Anva feels good if you're taking a big Crisis unit, which is where I would probably go with Tau right now. Yep. Uh, same sort of thing you were doing. Um, I would probably experiment with Tau Sept, Farset Enclaves, and Borkon together. One of those three is probably right. Yep. Uh, 
And then I think if you're not running far side enclaves, you want an ethereal net list. Yep. Now the question is, is he worth his points? You get two marker drones and a hover drone, so he moves faster than Anva. He, which is nice for completing aerospace because mm -hmm. he's a good aerospace completer. Yes. Um, the question is, do you want him or Anva? And at that point, he he's definitely in the top three choices. I mean, he's better than a than a Fireblade. Like, I think we can both agree on that. <laughs> I do agree that he brings more to the Fireblade, unless you're taking 30 Breachers, like we said. Yeah. And then I would actually want the Fireblade. Yeah, the Fireblade then goes out, and then all of it's exploding, all of it hits on threes, you know, wounds on threes, real ones, and you're like, all right, you're dead. Um, I don't know. I think promotion to Shazel. I think yeah. second highest. I, I do think he he's solid enough to make it here, where in those seps, you probably end up wanting him, but if you don't run him, it's not the end of the world. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about Anva. All right, so Anva is uh, one of the named ethereals. He's specifically in Tau Sept, but he has leadership cast, uh, just like on Shi, in which he can go into uh, any of the Tau Sept, uh, or sorry, any of the Tau Empire armies, except Farsight Enclaves, and not prevent you from um, benefiting from any of your Sept tenants. There is an yep. issue with Philosophies of War, which is the army-wide rule for pure Tau armies, in which you get access to Monkar or Kalyan. Uh, technically, Anva going in another army would disrupt that. I think this is an oversight, and the major tournaments uh, have agreed that this is an oversight. So you have seen uh, a lot of the big events rule that you can take Anva in Borkon or Sisea or whatever. Yeah, it, it's an oversight that GW just hasn't fixed, which is fairly common. Yep, um, <laughs> unfortunately. Unfortunately, but, but... That's why you go with the TO rulings, because if you're playing yeah. an event, this is what you're most likely yeah. going to see. Always look that up. If you're not running Tau Sept and you're running Anva, make sure your, your tournament... Uh, is ruling it that you can take him yep. without losing Montcar Kion. Because it's legal to take him, but you might just lose Montcar or Kion. Yep. And that's not so, worth it. Yep, double check on that. Um, his aura of Leadership 10 is 9 inches, so it's a bit longer, but he is slower because he cannot take the Hover Drone. He's minus 1 to wound with a 5-up Invuln and has his two Honor Guards, uh, which are okay in combat, but are just ablative wounds for him. Yeah. So he's a bit more durable. He's quite a bit more durable than the regular Ethereal. Yes. Uh, he moves slower, so him on his profile is worse, but he doesn't cost you a CP to cast two on a two plus, which mm -hmm. is dope. And he knows a third one, which is Zephyr's Grace, which you actually do want to sub in for that plus one CP mm -hmm. occasionally, and having access to it is substantial. Yeah. He is 105 points, I believe, or 100 flat. I'll look it up. Uh, now. I don't think he's 100 flat. He might even be more than 105. It's one of those two. Uh, so he's pretty... He's right around the same cost as that ethereal. I like him quite a bit because, like Jack said, you don't have to spend a CP for the humble stave on him, and that's ultimately why I went uh, for on Va. Yeah. He's uh, 100 flat, which is pretty good, and he knows three casts two. I think he's just better than an ethereal. I think he falls into Shasso's favorites. Yep. I think if you're taking an ethereal... It is going to be on ball. I think he's Probably. the best right now. Unless you're really hurting for Mark Light and Warlord trait caddies. Because yep. Anva is great, but he can't hold a Warlord trait. And he doesn't have Mark Lights. Whereas if you pay 15 more you and a CP, unfortunately, you get a guy who knows one fewer power, moves faster, has Mark Lights, can have Exemplar of the Montka, yep. and you go from there. Yep. So it does depend. Um, like in Sasea, I actually like having the regular Ethereal because he's a caddy for the Sasea Warlord trait to give out OPSEC. Yep. which Anva cannot be. So it does. it is a little situational, but I think Anva is superior, in my opinion. Anshi. This Anshi. is the other named ethereal. He is from Viorla Sept. And the uh, reason... He's looking in Dial Dalith. Yeah, it's not Dalith. Uh, well, the re so what he does is he hits harder in combat than the other ethereals. <laughs> and he has a 4 of involved. He has a, a relic called Fidelity, uh, which is uh, strength 5, AP 2, 2 damage, and every 6 to hit scores an additional hit. So he does hit harder than all the other ethereals. How many attacks does he have? He has 5. Okay, and does he have a rule that lets him like do anything in combat? What do you mean anything? Like, like amp up his damage at all? No, no, no. He, oh. It's his profile. Okay, well... <laughs> uh. so uh outside of that he has a buff for viorla which is um i believe yeah letting them hold steady or set to defend if they're within six so if you're running viorla you probably run him just because that rule is cool but outside of that he has the six inch aura of leadership 10 for your core units and uh, he can go in other uh seps he has a shield gen which means he's substantially tougher than yep. a regular ethereal yep he's four up invuln and then he also knows three invocations and they go off on a two up so you don't have to spend cp on him either yeah, so However, he's, he's like a uh, budget on Va, except he costs five points more. 
Yep, because he hits harder in combat. Yeah, specifically. Well, you know, so that's important. <laughs> Anva is still tougher because he's minus one to wound and has two buddies that are just giving him ablative wounds. Yep, and I just would prefer having Anva's aura of nine inches of leadership bubble instead of six. Yes, because he's a Tau Sept. He increases his auras by three. Well, no, he has it on his data sheet. Oh, so then it goes up. He to doesn't 12. benefit from his Tau Sept if he's not in Tau Sept. So he just has a nine inch aura, whereas. Uh, oh, I see. I see. Yep. If he is in Tau Sept, it does go up to twelve. It does. And that point you're just leadership 10 yep on all those core units which is amazing so i think anshi is he's kind of a disappointment yeah he should hit if his whole thing is i hit harder in combat he should hit legitimately hard in combat he should have like reroll hits or something please yeah something else um, um also viola is one of the if not the worst sept I, I think he falls into reliable rank and file because he is knows three casts two on a two plus. That's fair. That's literally it. If Anva thinking, didn't exist, we would debate between the ethereal and Anshi. That's fair, but because Anva exists, he's kind of pointless, in my opinion. That's true. But him on him but, as as himself, we'll like, say is as not himself. That bad. Yeah. Yeah. What's his word? I don't care what his word trade is. Uh, to forget about that. It's the CP regen for Viorla, which is the the reverse of the pure tide engram chip. Pure tide engram chip refunds two types of stratagems. The Viorla Warlor trait relor, um, refunds, refunds the, others. the others too. Fair enough. Okay, Dark Strider. He has a whole bunch of rules here. He's Tau Sep specific, and he has a cool weapon called Shade, which is Assault 2, 24 inches, uh, Strength 5, AP 2, 2 damage. Not bad. And he also has a Marker Light. Yep, the Marker Light's sweet. Yep. Uh, he hits on twos. He doesn't have a really cool defensive profile because uh, he's just a Fire Warrior dude. Uh, he has Structural Analyzer. In your command phase, you pick a friendly uh, Tau Sept core unit within six and one enemy unit visible um, to the model. And until the end of the turn, uh, each time a Tau Sept core unit uh, makes an attack, a ranged attack against it, you get plus one to wound. Is that nine inches in Tau Sept? Because uh, uh, the command phase yep. abilities go up as well. Yes, yeah, yeah. it's command phase and auras. However, the problem with this is it's in your command phase, so he has to have line of sight to the unit going into your turn. Yeah, it's mostly when people try to stat check you, a thing exactly. you don't generally see against Tau, but occasionally can. It's good into Chaos Knights with a guy that turns off your rerolls, because you point at him and go, all right, plus one to wound against you. Brah! Yep, 100%. Bob, I'm going to get to your wonderful super chat in just a second. We'll finish this uh, Dark Strider data sheet. So target upload is another rule. He can start the marker light action at the end of the movement phase instead of the start, which is Very just useful. like Pathfinders. It lets you move and then start it. Um, it's a great rule. Uh, then drone familiar cluster. Each time the model selected to shoot, you get to reroll a hit and a wound roll. That's in addition to Tau Sept's. So re he basically rerolls hits and wounds because yep. he has a two shotgun. Yep. And then his uh, fighting retreat is an aura of wall of friendly Tau Sept core unit, excluding battle suit units, and that where this rule becomes a lot less efficient and effective. Within six of the model gets to fall back uh, and shoot. Yep. So if that I... didn't have the battle suit exclusion, he would be automatic and actually a really good character that you see all the time. Because it doesn't, it rarely comes up. And then finally, he has a pregame move of up to seven inches, more than nine from enemy units, because he's a Pathfinder. So I actually think Dark Strider's not terrible. He's only 60 points for a plus one to wound. Now it has to be something he can see in the command phase. Um, you know, there, there are restrictions on it, but sometimes Toughness 8 comes out and you really want that plus one to wound. For the suite of rules you get here, he is worth 60 points. Yes. The issue comes in in the HQ slots. Yeah, which Arcs of Omen has opened up significantly, right? You get four without having to spend any CP. Exactly. Um, but in my opinion, he should not be an HQ, but an elite character. Elite character would help him a lot. I think Arcs of Omen gives him a reason to exist because before you would just you really would have trouble validating like why is this guy in my list for the slots, um, but in Tau Sept, especially because you would take multiple you know commanders and those would fill up half of the slots you take and then other things. So the thing is in uh, in Tau Sept you have four. He's still going to probably get crunched out. He is getting crunched out because you're going to take two commanders, you're going to take Long Strike, and you're going to take on Va. Now you're out of HQ slots. Yep. So it still sucks. He's not bad. Like 60 points for what he does is kind of ridiculous. It's very solid. I would take him if he was an elite HQ. Uh, sorry, an elite slot instead of HQ. 100%. HQ, he is just 
competing for slots with people who are essential, and that yep. is a rough place to be. But his rules are actually good. So where do you want to put him in? I think he's in these two categories. Yeah. His Because of the nature of the detachment system, I think he's here. But his rules by themselves are here. Yeah, but put him at the top of reliable rank. I mean, we can put him there and just say, you're still probably not taking him because you need all four of those HQs. Yep, you're going to see all four above him. <laughs> and that means you have to take it's those unfortunate. First. Uh, we got Mr. Bob Woodhouse. Thank you so much for the $10 super chat. Really appreciate your support. And he asks, the advanced EM Scrambler has a second ability. It does indeed. Which is a, pick a unit within six inches, I believe in your command phase. And, it might be uh, 12. I think it's 12, but it does matter. Command phase makes it really restrictive. Yeah, uh, and you, they don't benefit from auras, I believe. Oh, turns that's, auras, that's not bad. Which is cool. Um, it doesn't really come up just because at the end of the day... When your opponent is that close to you, you're, they're usually not benefiting from auras anyway. It's only if the unit itself has an aura, and most units, their auras don't affect them. So it's a little iffy on whether you actually... I've never used it before, but it, it does exist. It does. It does. It does exist. So Man. thank you so much, Bob. You know, if Dark Strider weren't in Tau Sept, he'd be so much better. Yeah. I mean, I understand, like, for fluff reasons he is, but the fact he has to compete with Long Strike is just... It's a shame. Because yeah. they're both great. And long but that's why I, I think he could easily fit into the, the elite slot. Exactly. And be yeah. one of those characters that then doesn't take up a slot. And you but get the... If he were like Borkan, I think he, you would see him all the time. Probably. If he were Farsight Enclaves, you'd see him all the time. But because he competes exactly with Long Strike, it's just... Also, Tau Sept has their stratagem, the last two editions, as plus one to wound against a target. Yeah. So how many pluses to wound do you actually need? Yeah. Is another question. Yeah. It's unfortunate. He's being held back by where he, what... Uh, Septi's in. Okay. But let's talk about Longstrike. This long guy's strike. awesome. He's a hammerhead. He's a hammerhead. But he's a lot better than a hammerhead. He's, he's the only good hammerhead, really. <laughs> so first of all, he's plus one ballistic. So he's BS3, which means with a marker light, he's BS2. That's huge. That's so big. He has that hammerhead reroll to hit in there. He's uh, T7, 14 wounds with a three up, which is not bad. He uh, can take two accelerator burst cannons, which means he has 16 shots at strength 6, AP 1, 1 damage. Could take the gun drones and pop them off if you want to, but you'll probably have enough drones to save your protocol to help keep him alive anyway. And then he can access the railgun, so he can do very efficient uh, long-range damage or submunitions if you want to. He is a gunship ace, so each time the hammerhead model makes a ranged attack against a monster or vehicle, you get plus one to wound. That's huge. You pretty much always want to put them into a tough vehicles and monsters anyway so he just hits on twos against a lot of things and wounds on twos against those top targets with a reroll to hit and a reroll to wound because he's tau sept it's it's very it's good. finally it's reliable yeah, it's, it's reliable I, although i have missed multiple times in long strike for some same reason. here bud i don't know how how does it happen jack i i don't miss with him i fail to wound i, I is, miss with him you hit on you wound on a two re-rolling you're like one one you're like to be fair, I did roll Snake Eyes into Snake Eyes on a, a three inch char uh, or a like almost auto charge in Age of Sigmar. So <laughs> it's pretty pretty great. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> okay, uh, he is an X O two pilot battle suit. Okay, and this is his re this is the strongest rule he has. It's amazing. In your command phase, you select one friendly Tau Sep core unit, which could be your crisis unit. Or a Tau Sept Hammerhead within six it's of a, this. <laughs> it's the crisis it's, it's unit. It's the crisis unit. It's the crisis unit. And until the start of your next command phase, each time a model makes an attack, the target is treated as having a marker light. So you know that amazing Farsight Enclaves rule where you're within nine inches and you count as having a marker light? Yeah. You just count as having it. That's your long strike says you have it, and it means that, like you were talking about airbursts before, yep. they just have a marker light it's on them. The doesn't matter that they can't see their opponent. Only it's, way to put marker lights on units you cannot see. You can split fire with literally every gun. So my crisis model has, you know, three different guns. One gun here, one gun here, one gun here, one gun here, one gun here. Yep, you can all, do that. And you and just have marker lights on all Here's them. Here's a hidden piece of tech. Technically, rules is written, you still pull a marker light off the target, even if you count them as already having one. But here's what you do, all right? You're almost always going to be shooting this unit with strike and fade, which happens at the start of the shooting phase, right? So what you do is you tar you hit them with long strike, so they count every target as having a marker light, so you don't need marker lights on their targets. You shoot them, you see what happens, you strike and fade the unit, and then, since it's operating at the same timing window, start of the shooting phase, it's your turn. You decide, all right, I want marker lights to resolve after that. So then, after the crisis suit unit shoots, counts as having a marker light against all its targets, 
Then you go, all right, let's see what survived. Let's see where the board lies. All right, Markle, 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 Markle. Now, WTC has preempted this with their latest FAQ update, which says that if you have a rule that counts you as having a marker light, you don't take away marker lights. Thankfully, which, I mean, they didn't have that last year. Exactly. Which is why they, I had to do that. Yeah, so <laughs> they have preempted that, and uh, that that's excellent. So hopefully other tournaments rule the same way. That would be fantastic. And that would, it just, but it still makes hoop. life easier because then you see where the board is before you fire your marker lights. Uh, he does explode for on a six for d6 mortals so every it is, time it is dangerous mm -hmm. um, but he's amazing in tau sept he's automatic in my opinion for if sure you're running tau sept this is actually one of the main reasons you are running tau sept long strike's great he makes the airburst unit work really well I and mean, he makes the airburst unit work otherwise yeah, the airburst unit does not work nope. right you're hitting on fives and with him you're hitting on fours like it's just it's yep. it's different and your crisis you, your crisis commanders like ignore modifiers to your hit roll too yep. so uh, he makes the Airburst unit work. He makes generic Crisis units so much better. He himself is actually a reliable hammerhead, a thing we'll get to in a bit. He's amazing. He's an auto intake. Do it. Uh, you also take him with the Accelerator Burst cannons, and he fires a lot of shots at AP1 that are plus one to wound into monsters and vehicles. So your opponent, you know, is maybe like 14 wounds or something, takes like 10 off the railgun, is like, all right, well, I survived. And you're like, Brah! all right, you're dead. Yeah, and he's a great target with those shots for a coordinated engagement to get them to AP2. Yep, and with plus one to wound, it's it's vicious. It's vicious. Okay, so uh, moving on, that's the HQs. Uh, we got troops now. So we have the Breacher team here. Breacher teams, in my opinion, are quite a solid troop. Um, you can take just one squad and have that in a Devilfish hanging around being annoying. If your opponent kills the Devilfish, Obsec pops out onto objectives. They've got decent firepower, and uh, their gun is the Pulse Blaster, 8 inches, with Assault 2 is Strength 6, AP2, 1 damage, or the longer range is 14, uh, Strength 5, AP1, 1 damage. It's pretty solid. Um, they do benefit a lot from coordinated engagement, and um, you could throw a guardian drone on them so that they can only be wounded on, um, uh, they can't be wounded on uh, ones or twos, which yeah. it's a 10 point upgrade. It means a lot of the stuff that would wound them on twos doesn't, and it could make a difference. It's not bad. It helps against strength six for, exactly. uh, for sure. But uh, otherwise, they're still relatively cheap at 85 points, and they can actually do damage. Uh, they can also advance and shoot, which is a nice thing. They actually hit quite hard, and I really like them in Devilfish. I actually like multiples of them in Devilfish with the Fireblade in Farsight Enclaves. Yep. And you just, you don't have to do the move 12, get out, do things, but you will move those things up board next to objectives so that they don't really want to kill them because, as you said, guys will get out. And then you just say, this is a thing I can do. I can shoot you with 30 of these guys next turn in your castle. Yep. You do with that information what you want. Yep. And they're obsects, 10 obsect bodies that could just pile onto objectives yep. and, and make it annoying to deal with. And while you're trying to deal with the other Tau units that are in front of you, you're like, am I do, ha do I have time to actually shoot at these breachers yep. and these devilfish? Also really good if you're planning to take aerospace, you need at least one of these units to go do a hard one. You know, you get out 12, you get out after, and then you go do an aerospace. And yep. and because they're fire warrior, they auto do it. Mm -hmm. They do it at the end of your turn. Otherwise, you have to survive there, which can be tough sometimes. Yep. Um, so I like them as, as I think the, the better of the two fire warrior teams. The other one is the strike team. So I'll we'll just talk about both of them and then we can rank them both. The strike team has a longer inch, a longer range gun, the pulse rifle. It's 36 inch range. It's rapid fire. So with an 18, it's two shots at strain five, AP one, one damage. And you can buff the AP on it with the stratagem. Breacher strat is amazing. It is uh, reroll wounds and ignore cover for one CP. Uh, whereas the strike team gets the extra AP um, on their pulse rifles. Yeah, extra AP on and, pulse rifles, not bad. And they count as um, at max range for uh, rapid fire. So yeah, that's not that important. It's okay. It's you fine. can also, on either of them, do one CP, six is auto wounds. Um, which, which is, is not bad. Something to think about. You can't take them in more than tens. The biggest problem I have with them is you can no longer take them in five man units. And that was a huge deal in 8th edition, and why I really loved just cheap obsec that could flow out of Devilfish and, and contest objectives. Be, having forced to take them in 10 mans has limited their utility, and you just start running out of points. That's yes. what I found. Now, strike teams are cheaper than breachers. By 5 points, yep. Yep, but breachers, when you need something dead at close range, will actually do it. Whereas strikes are kind of this reliably mid-range damage output, and I just don't think that's as, as valuable. Yep. So, in my opinion, Breachers are reliable rank and file. 
unless you're building around a breach or fish rush, then they would be a bit higher. They'd be here. Yeah. But I think for most armies, it's just you're probably taking maybe one to two of them, and they're going to sit in the devilfish and, and do something when you need it. Yeah. But they're going to kind of just hang around. They're fine. They're good. You probably want a unit in fish just to help with aerospace if you need to take it. Just be, you know, obsec on objectives when you need to put it there. They're just good. Yep, they're just, just solid. And then the strike team, which is over here, I think is honestly the first fire cast disappointment. Yep. I think they just compare very unfavorably with their their siblings, the breachers, and there's no real reason to run them. Yeah, they don't you don't need to fill a troop tax anymore. Nope. So So you have you're taking them for their data sheet profile, and I'd rather actually be able to do um, get that higher AP natively, and that strength six is, is yeah. really nice. The up close reroll wounds, ignores cover, shooting profile breachers is scary. Yep. And in a way that the strike teams just aren't. All right. Uh, we have a super chat here from Gilam. Thank you so much with a six euro super chat. Apologies for my ignorance. I am new. Well, welcome to the Warhammer community and the Art of War. Thank you so much for joining us. Never hear people talk about the Nova Surge plasma rifle. No invuln save seems powerful to me. Um, as um, you know, I, your opponents make a lot of it. <laughs> yeah, they, they have a lot of it. Uh, so it is solid. It's a little pricey because the plasma rifle is not that cheap. Yeah, so you're it's effectively like 30 points total. I believe it's 30 points total. And what you're thinking about is it's one shot per turn on this. Yeah. It realistically has to be on the commander with precision of the hunter, which means you're not taking the advanced burst cannon on them or you're not taking the thermonutronic projector. And those benefit a lot more for the rerolls because they have a lot more volume of fire. The thing is, when I've taken it on a commander who doesn't have rerolls to hit, I just miss with it, and then it feels really bad to yeah. take it. Where it's good, I think, is in Farsight Enclaves or Tauset, where they have that reroll. And if you have one very powerful shot, you can use that reroll on it. Um, the problem is, you now have two commanders. You yep. get two commanders, and I will tell you, the uh, DWO2 burst and the thermonutronic projector are just better. They're just better. And so that means, and they're also cheaper. You know, the, yeah. the thermo is 25 total, and the DWO2 is, I believe, also 25. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just, they're better, they're cheaper. That's why you don't see them. I was actually taking Nova Surge off and on in my like triple Cold Star list before ARCs came out, but with ARCs, yeah. uh, unfortunately, I think it doesn't. But I took it when the Codex came out. Jack saw, you know, just go bleed through all those custodies that were out there. It was very annoying. <laughs> and having one shot that you know is going to work, I really liked it on um, Master of the Killing Blow, again, in the triple Cold Star list, because you would shoot someone low and then you just have one shot that for sure just kills them or for sure gets past a phase cap and does damage to like um, uh, Abaddon or something like that. It was all right, but the limit to commanders means that you just don't have a third guy to put this on. That's the uh, main issue. Yep. But thank you very much for your super chat, Guillaume. Yep, thank you so much. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and move on to the last troop choice here, which is Kroot. This used to be when Tau was a double patrol army, it was your troop tax. You take two Kroot units of Kroot to fill that out, and sometimes you see Breachers, but Kroot almost always won out. And they have a pregame move. They were cheaper by a significant margin. They have gone up a uh, point per model, so they're seven points now, so 70 for the unit, yep. which means a unit of Kroot is 15 points cheaper than 10 Breachers, which is getting to the point where I kind of would rather have Breachers. Um, so they've they got a nerf in points, and on top of that, they're not needed with the Arcs of Omen detachment, so they've almost entirely fallen out of favor. Yeah, they're, the fact that they're not needed means that when you take a troop, you want to do something, and Breachers do a thing, and troop don't. Yep. So, in my opinion, they used to be automatic and up here, and I think they're down here now. Yep, I think they are a <laughs> disappointment. <laughs> I think you they're... may want to move over the, uh, the strike team there. And... Oh, yeah. yeah I'm yeah. going to move the strike team over. Yep. Okay. Strike team, go there. Boom. Yep. There we go. And now we have Kroot in the Firecast Disappointment. They just don't do a thing. You hey. need things done. They don't do it. If you want something that pregame moves, take Kroot Hounds. If you want something that's objective secured, take Breachers. And there's literally nothing else they do. Yep. It's it's unfortunate. Um, there's still decent banner raisers, but honestly, I have the Shaper. I've got you know shooting and doing it. I have other characters like the Ethereal that can do it. Occasionally, it's the 6-inch Heroic Strat comes up where you can protect an objective against checks notes like Harlequins. 
with them. Uh, that's basically it. Eldar, you can protect it against them. Anyone else will just take a hit from these guys and keep on trucking. Like sisters, I guess. Toughness three armies, you can protect objectives. Yeah. Because um, they use six inch heroic and you get an extra attack a guy for the stratagem. It's a great stratagem, but like their profiles are so Then garbage, you kill the unit matter. and you spend one CP to give them a five of Fiona Pain. Hell yeah. And then they die <laughs> anyway. Grizzly feast. <laughs> yeah, you feast grizzly. Uh, but so it's just, it's not reliable. And honestly, your most opponents can just tank it and then kill like enough of the squad that. Yep. They're also at risk of being wrapped by things, uh, which is a problem uh, because they don't. If they get wrapped by something serious, they can't really do too much about it. You have to desperate break out them. Whereas breachers can just, for one CP, shoot into combat, um, and then you get the you, your close range profile against that. So there, there's a number of reasons not to take them. Uh, speaking of another data sheet that doesn't do anything whatsoever, uh, the Krutox Rider. Yeah, let me find the current points on a Krutox It's 25 rider. points, I believe. That sounds right to me. I think it's the yeah, same points. Yeah, it's 25 points per guy. You can take up to three. <laughs> and in exchange for that, you do uh, checks notes, no damage. Um, I mean, so let's let's take a look, right? They're cavalry, which means they have to walk around walls. They move seven, so they basically don't move. 75 points for something with a six-up save and four wounds at toughness five is very fragile. In combat, they are not bad. They are not bad in combat. They have... 12 they attacks. They have Krutok's fists, okay? <laughs> yeah, it's strength 6, AP 2, damage 2, 4, Tau. That's actually pretty good in combat, but you're never getting it there with cavalry and movement 7. They can heroic 6, I believe. That might just be restricted to infantry. I've never taken Krutox riders in my life. The Krutons can do it, though, and they're not infantry. All right, fair. So I think right, I think the Krutoxes can do it, but... <laughs> Their guns are terrible. Uh, it's 6 shots, strength 7, AP 1, damage 2. It's, 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 heavy, an though, so. it's an auto cannon. It's an auto cannon. They're yeah. cavalry. <laughs> They're cavalry, so I believe they get around the heavy penalty. I thought cavalry doesn't. I think it's just infantry that take the heavy penalty. Oh, okay. I thought it was monsters and vehicles ignored that. Well, it doesn't matter because you're not <laughs> taking them anyway. I believe it's a uh, key. It's locked to infantry. Chat, tell us which one. <laughs> now, the thing that keep is keeping it from being a scapegoat for Anva's death is the fact that you're you can take a one man, and it's cheap, and it can be a screen. It can be cheap. It's worse than Crude Hounds for sure, but Crude Hounds are not going to be in Firecast Disappointment. <laughs> if you were forced to take a three-man unit, scapegoat for Anva's death for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, unfortunately, it's just competing with a different Crude unit that we'll get to in uh, in a little bit. Those are the Hounds, and they're just dramatically better in every single way, yep. pretty much. Less said about these guys, the better. All right. Next up, uh, you know them, you love them. They're Crisis Battle Suits. We've been talking about them this entire time. We talked about all the buffs that they can receive. So I'm going to automatically just put them up here. Yep, you do that. We're just going to do that. Mm -hmm. And Jack, why don't you run us down why Crisis Suits are still amazing, even though they're pricey. Okay, so Tau don't have great secondaries. They have fine secondaries. They don't have good ones. So you need to kill your opponent. All right, so what is what do you need to do in order? What do you need to put in your kit in order to kill your opponent? You need something that hits really hard, moves fast, and can take a punch. What in this book here can do that? <laughs> Crisis suits. <laughs> what can also receive all of your buffs at the same all time? All of them, all of them. Every single one. Those um, commanders are restricted to Crisis Core. Oh, is... it's, it's also Crisis suits. <laughs> um, yeah, they're great. You can, they're expensive. They are very expensive. They're, they're, I mean, they're incredibly expensive. Yeah. <laughs> but when you kit them out and you give them all the buffs and, you know, it's like a thousand points with support and everything, they do work. They do the, you know, the they make Adam cast pull his hair work. out. They really do. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that's basically it. You need something that can go and actually initiate fights, dig your opponent out, shoot them until they're dead, um, and be durable enough to actually take a punch back, and that's Crisis Suits and nothing else. Um, Riptides kind of get close, but they're not reliable in their they're damage in the same way that Crisis Suits just kill things. And they don't receive the same buffs. It's the fact that the commanders are Crisis Core buffs that's where crisis suits get over the edge. If those buffs were core units or just battle suit or something like that, I think we would see much more diverse tau lists in general, but because they're crisis core, crisis suits are the best. Yeah, it, it is really pushes you into play style where you take crisis suits, you move 18 inches, which not that many shooting units can move 18 inches with fly and fall back and shoot. So like you can just get angles other people can't. You move a critical mass of shooting and nonsense and durability to a place where you own the board, because there's usually a place on most boards where you can see down more, most sight lines, 
or you can threaten to move to see down most sight lines. Yep. And then... It's literally how I played the whole stream else for RTT. Yep. So just go back and check any of those games yep. out. You move to a position where you control the board, you just start shooting your opponent, and then you dive on them and finish them off. Mm -hmm. And it's just not something other things in the book can do. It's a thing, I guess, Crisis Bodyguards can do, just worse. Uh, way worse, because they're worse, the same Way worse, because they have one less hard point. And they're the same yeah, points. Yeah, they're the same points. So, yeah, they're they're incredible. I We basically talked about them... You can give them any. You can give them one support system, three weapons. They're expensive. You can give them a bunch of drones, and then they go do basically an army's worth of work. Yep. You take a sergeant with uh, stim injectors. I've so, I've seen people cut stim injectors on the sergeant, and I always scratch my head about it's it. Foolish. Straight it, up foolish. Straight up foolish, Seeks. Um, it's no, ten points. It's ten points for like sometimes just blanking a turn of damage. It's insane. <laughs> so you give a sergeant, you know, iridium armor, shield, gen, uh, stim, and then the threshold to get into the rest of the unit is so hard. Yep. It's so hard to cross that gap um, because you need to put a certain amount of damage just to get through that one stupid guy. And if you put enough damage into the unit to do that, then you have to get into the rest of the unit, which can be difficult. And you have shield drones in the unit as well. So it makes it really hard to, like, crack that first opening layer. And your opponent has to expose a lot of their army to do it, and you just clean it up. Yep. So uh, Christ Suit's literally amazing. They have uh, awesome upgrades. The other thing that I would mention about them is um, at WTC right now, you can advance and shoot marker drone uh, marker. Models with marker lights that are drone or vehicles. Yes, they, okay? they explicitly Because in the codex it says um, you can move and do that action, and it doesn't specify what type of move. And so um, that's... It's, it's weird because in the main rulebook it says you can't advance and do an action, but WTC has explicitly allowed it, so... It's because they, the exception in the Tau Codex says that you can move and do it, and because they don't specify normal move, they're allowing any type of move to be able to be able to start it and do it yeah that's what they're ruling i think it's a bit wonky but i think it's literally amazing on crisis suits because yeah. you move the marker drones 18 as well get the angles with your plus one to hit and uh it's awesome it's so, very good for them if you're playing in wtc that. for sure yep crisis bodyguards i didn't do another crisis thing on here so you don't don't take crisis bodyguards you take the crisis suits because they have that extra point and there's really they used to be able to take um the reason you'd take bodyguards is you could take two mans and they could be little mission playing janks i called them the uh the ion bats or the fire bats depending on what loadout they were that was cool, especially in Sasea where you make a mob sack, you throw them, throw them across you the board. You protect your commanders with uh, bodyguard was also pretty good, but now bodyguard's gone. Exactly. Like so as a rule. There's just no reason to take them. Take your normal crisis suits. Yeah. They are straight up crisis suits with one fewer hard point, and there's no reason to do that. Um, you basically lose your support system, and that it's just not sucks. It's like crisis suits for the same points cost without ignores cover, without an invuln. No. Nope. I'm, I'm not about it. So... so uh, Bodyguards are down here. They're terrible. Yeah, I'll take them. Bodyguards are straight up worse than the, crisis suits. It does let you take more than three units of crisis suits, but the yeah. only way you're doing yeah. that is if you're taking like three man squads. And I personally don't like three man squads. I don't think they're efficient yep. because they do their damage, which isn't uh, as much as you want for their points because you can't really invest in buffs for them. And then they die. And having a durable crisis unit that shoots turn after turn, mint. Having a un unit of three man that comes down, no buffs, shoots, dies, terrible. It's terrible. Okay, we've got a super chat here from Mr. Sean Kruger. Thank you so much. Hey, Art of War, what is your hope for Tau in 10th edition? I'd love for Pulse Carbines to bring back pinning. I would like a reworking of the marker light system. I still think that they have not nailed it. Even though it's different than it was, marker lights should be reliable, and they just are not. Pathfinders are pretty reliable, but then you have to take an entire Pathfinder unit. I just, they have not quite mastered um, how to make uh, marker lights worth. I think they should go with the token system. Uh, whether it like judgment tokens or ambush tokens, whatever it is. But I honestly think that um, you shouldn't be putting extra emphasis on Tau units having to do actions or um, having to roll a three up as well. It's just there's a lot of restrictions on marker lights yeah. that I don't think should exist. I also think it should be more of a supporting role for marker lights rather than having this swarm of marker lights that all just roll at the start of the turn like or the start of the shooting phase. It's really obnoxious. Yeah. Um, I think this should be like you have five marker lights in your army. That's what you want. A vehicle that has like one is good, whereas a vehicle that has one now is just whatever. Really, the only way you're getting it is like masses of drones. Mm -hmm. uh, I I agree. I think marker lights are halfway to where they should be, and they're just. 
I think they should auto hit and they should just not be able to be taken in like the quantities that they're taking right now. Like I think a marker light should be, I point at you, unit gets plus yeah, one. They, they could say for if you're playing 1,000 point game, 1,500 point game, 2,000 point game, you start with X amount of marker lights and you place them uh, at yeah. the start of shooting. Yeah, I I think it would be awesome if like marker drones were not that expensive and like the and marker drones specifically like had a chance to fail, but the more marker drones you had in a unit made it automatic or more likely so that you don't get those swarms of just like 30 marker lights and you have to waste time slapping yeah. tokens down. I, I don't know how exactly to do it, but I, I think marker lights uh, need to be reworked. I also personally don't like the split of Kalyan versus Monka. I like that there's two intentional different philosophies, but how they split it up, restricting it to specific turns, I don't like as much. Other armies get amazing buffs the entire game, and Tau are pigeonholed with uh, not only the buff itself, but also secondary play to specific turns, and I don't find that particularly uh, fun. Yeah, I, I mean, I think they did a good job at making um, ones that you would want to take, the, even if they only affect three turns, but the most powerful one, obviously, would be ones that affect turns one, two, and three, because those are the most impactful turns in the game, probably mm -hmm. two and three specifically. Yeah. Um, and the fact that they nerfed Montka now meant you take Kalyon, and Kalyon only really kicks in like late game, like turn four and five is the point where it really starts becoming oppressive. And that's when the game is basically wrapped already. So I think they could take another pass at it, yep. you know, for sure. Maybe make it two, three, four, five, but weaker, and or one, two, three, four, but weaker. Yeah. Or what, something. What they did actually well in this codex is make Crisis Suits viable. And Crisis Suits weren't viable for almost the entirety of 8th edition until uh, the Farsight supplement came out. Yeah. Then they were good, and they have been good in this book, and they're actually worth taking. Um, are they too good? Probably. They, they definitely started too good. Um, I don't think they should be quite as expensive and do literally everything in the book, but they should be core to a Tau army. So yeah. I like that. I think they should have... I think it was really that the commander buffs are only restricted to them. That has hurt the other Tau units. Yeah, the the internal design of Tau has not aged particularly well. Um, basically, you have to go in on a crisis unit because you are priced into taking crisis, and they keep jacking the price of crisis up and up and up. It just drains points from the rest of your list. It doesn't actually reduce the amount of crisis suits you take. Yeah. So... Um, yeah, I, I think I think they Tau should be very happy to get a rework. I think it's in an all it's in a good place right now, but I think that a rework is uh, is going to be very healthy for the Codex. Yep. All right, stealth battle suits. I just ran uh, several of these at the Streamhouse RTT. So they move eight inches. They are T four, two wounds apiece, three up save, uh, leadership nine on the Chazvray. They can bring a homing beacon, in which you can do an action in your command phase to be able to bring in a crisis core unit turn one. Specifically good in Farsight Enclaves, where you can then reroll full hit and wound rolls. Uh, although still pricey and you don't really see that as much anymore. It used to be very popular. And uh, you can take them in a minimum three squad for 75 points. They're 25 points a model. You can take up to two drones in the unit. And uh, you can get the maximum of six, six stealth models and two drones which is a pretty yeah. tanky unit. They're always minus one to hit shooting in combat. And when they're benefiting from cover, so that's light cover, dense cover, heavy cover, if that exists, uh, you add an additional plus one to the armor saves uh, against ranged attacks. Yeah, stealth suits are great. No ifs, ands, or buts. They're good as like a bit of a larger unit. They're good as a three man with one drone or zero drones. They're just good in general. Yep, and they also forward deploy. So they're the main, even though you have a lot of pregame moves with Tau, you can actually push back your opponent's forward deploys with your own stealth suits. And they each have a burst cannon. That's six shots, string five. Coordinated engagement is very effective on them. It, it used to be that with Montka, they would actually hit really hard, but uh, unfortunately Montka's AP went away. So they they are now good at, uh, at the skirmish fight. Yep. But they're not going to contribute to like the main fight. What I have found, and they are core, which is important, so they can reroll ones to hit from the commanders, and on top of that, they can get the Fibro Fino Pain from uh, the Ethereal. I have found that on WTC boards and on um, our Art of War format, the vents that we have, the ones that are light and dense cover, make stealth suits very annoying to deal with. Yes. Very, very annoying to deal with. You can, instead of forcing the overcommitment from your opponent with your crisis unit, you can actually do it with a large stealth suit unit yep. um, to get them out there because these stealth suits are amazing at move blocking and tying up enemy units in combat as well. And... Um, I, I think they're just a very good tool right now. I actually want a second larger squad in my list. Yeah, I would probably um, 
I'd probably run several units of stealth suits. They're just great. They skirmish amazingly. They're Very great for aerospace because they can actually survive on the flanks as well. Yeah, for sure. They just walk over, do aerospace, and your opponent has to do a lot in, to try and dig them out. In Borcom, because they're battle suit, they're minus one strength to incoming range weapons as well. Yeah, that's pretty good. It's good against strength four, which then it's a joke into them. It's good into strength uh, five. And the reason I started putting them in my list is because indirect fire still exists in the game. You have the airburst housept unit. You have mortars from guard. You have desolation. Um, desolation marines. With the minus one to hit, and specifically that additional plus one save in combat and in, uh, in cover, plus the indirect fire buff, you're actually very tanky with these yeah, guys, Desola especially in Borkon. Yeah. In Borkon, Desolation Marines when you're on fives, um, the mortars are unaffected, but uh, other uh, airburst units are also going to wound you on fives, and that's the point. A stealth suit just being shot there. by Desolation Marines in you know Devastator Doctrine still gets two ups. Yep. Love and that. That is very powerful because crew towns do evaporate against that eventually. Stealth suits survive and they can just hold down that flank by themselves. You don't have to worry about your back objective being killed. You don't have to worry about your side objective being killed away. And you can just exist and play a game. Personally, having played the Streamhouse RTT, I think that I would not leave home without one stealth suit unit, if not more. But I could very easily see them being here. I don't feel a need to hold you back. I think we might be over-representing Shasso's favorites, which kind of dilutes the really, really good units in there. Yeah. But I would personally also not write a list without stealth suits, so I'm not here to hold you back. Okay. Let's let's put it here for now, because I think this is just you're just always running one right now. I, I feel like they're very strong, especially in Borkon. In Borkon, they're definitely up here. Yeah. I like having one unit to hold down a side objective that doesn't die, and I like one and I like a second unit to kind of like skirmish on their side objective and force a commitment. Yeah. So I like both of those. And the cool thing is with the Scrambler Man on one side and the Stealth Suits on the other, Stealth Suits minus two to in any incoming charge, and then you have the Shaper, you can't come within 12. Now you control two flanks for very cheap. Yeah. Very effectively. So now we get into uh, GW's attempt to give you kind of an off-tank unit, uh, give you a <laughs> unit you can do you get, take get into reasonable fights with. So <laughs> Do you want to do it or do you want I'll, I'll take Ghost Kills. Okay, okay. So Ghost Kills are... I'm going to start this out by saying they're not as... They're not... Everyone treats them like they're a joke. They're not a joke. They're just not good enough. <laughs> they are not terrible. They're fine. Their profile... Like, when I took one in a game and I used it against John, he was... Every time I brought up his profile, John was like, that's better than I thought it was. Because people looked at Ghost Skills and thought it was, like, utter garbage. It's not utter garbage. I'm probably going to uh, advocate for reliable rank and file for it. But that's not good enough to make most of our lists, as we said before. Um, so Ghost Keel has 12 wounds, and it moves 12, and it can forward deploy. Um, it is minus one to be hit at range as a three-up save, and it has uh, two drones with it. And then those drones, I believe, make it so that you cannot be shot unless you're the closest to eligible target. Within 18. Within 18 inches. Um, so it is very annoying to deal with. Because it can, there are times like if you buff a crisis suit unit to the nines and it's in the middle of the board, you can just have cold, uh, you can have ghost kills behind it just shooting shots downrange. Um, part of the reason why I didn't see any play was because Armored Contempt was a thing and the Cyclic Ion Raker is just not great, right? The Cyclic Ion Raker into Armor of Contempt in cover was just giving them their native save and I don't think that was good enough. Now the Cyclic Ion Raker doesn't have to deal with that, so I do. I think Ghost Kills got better with Arcs of Omen and all the changes there. They definitely did. did. They definitely did. Did it get good enough to take? I don't know. It's toughness seven in Borkon. That is annoying to deal with. Strength eight wounds it on fours. Um, strength seven wounds it on strength fives. Strength eight isn't affected. Sorry, strength eight isn't affected. My bad. Yep. But the strength seven. Strength down seven is. is very affected. Strength four is affected, which does matter. Strength seven going into it is just completely ineffective. Like you have a shootout with uh, armagers, like Helverins, and yeah. they don't do anything to exactly. you. Exactly. <laughs> so that is that's very nice. Also, if they lose a wound as a result of a ranged attack with a strength characteristic of seven or more, they have a five up feel no pain. If you take spend a lot of points on that. Eh. It's like a twenty five point upgrade. Is it a twenty five point upgrade? It's very pricey. So they're hundred and sixty base and they come with two drones, which is very good for like shilling big wounds too. Because mm -hmm. you take little wounds on him and then one CP at Dark Lance just goes to a drone and you're like, alright, we're good. They're more annoying to get rid of than you would want. It's 15 points for a flare okay. launcher. For, so it's 175. For feel no pain, and that's pretty good. If you upgrade him to the fusions, you'd have to pay even more. I think uh, the fusion the is the same points cost. 
Yeah, fusion and cyclic ion are the same points cost. No, I mean the uh, the, the top weapons. Oh, the, the top weapons. Because flamers are free. Yeah, burst cannons and fusions are five points apiece, which is not terrible. So now you're getting up to 185. Yep. So here's my thesis. I think ghost kills are a solid unit. They're not bad at 160. They're probably not efficient enough to make it into lists, especially because they don't, they're not off tank in the same way that um, Riptides are, right? Riptides are durable and they can exist in a place without immediately dying. Whereas Ghost Kills really want something else to do the pushing as they kind of shoot. Uh, I know WTC last year, the German team had two of them. And part of that was because they let them redeploy nine inches away from your opponent, which is just not how the rules work. Um, they would be, I would actually think they would be fairly good if you could do that, but you can't. So I think they're all right. They're a bundle of stats that's annoying to get rid of, has decent firepower. They're all right. Are they, uh, are they good enough to take in most lists? No, nah, not really, but I think they're fine. And I got better for Marks of Omen. They definitely got better. Uh, lo not having to deal with Armor of Contempt is big. I will mention one other thing. Them, Ghost Skills, and Stealth Suits have a strat if you're within nine inches of a board edge. Um, I believe at the start of your movement phase, you can bring them back into reserve yeah. to come down the next turn. Why is that good? Well, it means that the, the Ghost Kill or the Stealth Suits can hold down a flank against, say, something like Scarbrand, and if they get trapped in combat, you can just bring them out with that strategy. You just bounce. You just bounce them out. I was going to do this against Nick if he brought Scarbrand. He didn't, so it didn't yeah. come up. But uh, World Eaters have a have a um, ability to trap things on combat in a 4-up, and there's yep. some other ways. And you just leave. So... If you're worried about those type of plays, these are actually pretty useful. Although, I just lean towards Stealth Suits, their infantry. Minus one to hit is so annoying on Ghost Kills. It, it is. It definitely is annoying. The biggest thing is the lack of invuln on a unit this this yeah. expensive. It, that hurts. Yeah, It you, gets obliterated by any combat unit. Whereas Stealth Suits, at least I have um, the shield drones that I could tank on. Yeah. I do think that as a, um, as a unit that moves 12 inches, it is not difficult to avoid... Most combat units and run around and try how, to avoid them because they I, move quite quickly. How I think about the Ghost Keel is a Sunshark bomber that doesn't have bombs, is slower, but is a more consistent and more durable fire support yep. platform. And your opponent can't just pick it out of your army the moment it comes yeah. in. That's how I think about it. It doesn't shoot quite as hard as the Sunshark bomber, but it's much more durable and will survive for more turns, yep. especially in Borkon. I also like just trying to cheese people with the here's my Crisis Suit unit that is buffed to the nines. And then here's three ghost kills that are just shooting, or two ghost kills that are just shooting. And you can't shoot the ghost kills. You have to go through my army the hard way. Is it worth it at this point? price point? Not really. But if it got a 10-point, 15-point uh, decrease, maybe the flare launcher went down five, suddenly this thing is very good, I think. Yeah, I, I think 130, 135 points is probably where it should be. And that is where I would think yeah. about taking maybe two of them. What I think it they're is best as... completely as, obnoxious to try to deal with. John was, like, having an aneurysm trying to deal with it. No, I mean, you see that with stealth suits. I like stealth suits better because the infantry and the synergy with cover and, and that. They're cheaper, too. And they're infantry, so they can raise banners and, and stand over there. But I think them and stealth suits, ghost kills on stealth suits, are very good at bumping into enemy units and trying to survive and just pinning them down, boot blocking, all that stuff. I just wish it had the invul. Even if it I, was a five up, I wish I had an invuln. It would go too. a long way, in my opinion. Minus one to hit is 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 very annoying. Maybe it could benefit from like light cover or something. But I agree, it is rank and file. It's okay. It's fine it's, if you want to include one one or two of these in your army. It's honestly not a bad choice, especially in Borkon. I, yeah, I like it the best in Borkon. Uh, yeah, I think so for sure. There, you probably do take the fusion because you get that extra range, which helps out so much. It really 22 inch range fusion blasters and a 28 uh, inch fusion collider is actually legitimately To be good. clear, I like these better than hammerheads. Let me put that in there. Uh, regular hammerheads? Yeah, regular I, I hammer would heads. agree. Yeah. Actually, I would move it up the ra uh, reliable rank and file. Like, yeah, like there-ish. I think they're not bad. As a bundle of stats, they're not bad. <clears throat> and in Borkon, I think they're particularly good with the fusion. Okay, let's move on to the Firesight Marksman. This is another character like the Kadra Fireblade that is basically a caddy for a Warlord trait if you don't want to run the Fireblade because you don't have Breachers. Yeah, and, and if you don't have an HQ slot... Sniper Drones are some of the worst models in the game. They are horrible. Their their profile is just obnoxiously bad, and you can no longer take the nine, man, nine model units. It's just three of them with the Marksman. He has a cool rule, uh, the Stealth Field, where if he uh, doesn't move, he... Uh, 
ranged attacks can only target him if he's the closest eligible within 12. So he can stand out in the open in a backfield objective and just hold it down for most of the game. Yeah. That is cool. However, in most good tournament formats, your home objective is pretty safe anyway, and you don't need extra help holding it with this guy. The sniper drones, like I said, are completely pointless as a unit. So he is 70 points, I believe. Yeah, he's 70. I haven't memorized some of these points because, honestly, they, they're just not good. I believe they are 70. <laughs> but I, I think... Because it's the same as a uh, Firesight Marksman. Uh, he is a Firesight, sorry. Same as a Fire Blade with two drones. But let me... Yep, he's 70. If he... Uh, if you're playing on really open boards, there is a consideration to run him as that character to just sit back there and do that. Still 70 points is a lot. Uh, and you can just string back drones in commanders to do it. But the biggest thing here is if the sniper drones did any sort of actual sniping, I would like this unit. But because they don't, it's pointless in my opinion. I agree. I but think it's, it's just worse than a fire sight. Mar uh, than a geez, fire blade. They sound exactly the same to me. Uh, it's just worse than a fire blade. Why are we taking it? Move yep. on. It is. It's a disappointment. Yep. All right, what's up next? Just basic tactical drones. So this is drones that are by themselves. Drones in commander units and crisis units, they're amazing. They're with those units up there. Yeah. The tactical drones by themselves, you really don't see. You have to buy a minimum of four, which means if you take four market drones, it's 40 points. And they're just there as a unit. It's not bad, but it's not... You just take them in units, is how I think about them. Yeah. They're, yeah, you take them in units. They're not that great because they're very easy to kill. Like, you don't take unit shield drones. There's no point to that. They're not protecting anything. You don't take unit gun drones. They don't hit particularly hard. They're very easy to kill. Like, very, very easy to kill. Yep. And unit of marker drones is also very easy to kill for, like, a one-time marker light bomb. It's, eh. not, it's not bad, but uh, honestly, it's probably... You're just not really taking this unit. Yeah, I think it's there. It just doesn't fit. just doesn't do anything. All right, we've got Pathfinders. So this is a unit I experimented with heavily before the Streamhouse RTT. I didn't end up running any of them, but I do think that they're actually pretty solid. Yeah, All right, so I think they're pretty good. Let's see. They're 90 points. They are Fire Warrior, so they benefit from the Aerospace update where they finish it at the end of the turn. Which is big. Um, and they also benefit from other Fire Warrior-like stratagems. The main way I think about them is, first of all, they have the most reliable marker lights uh, in the Codex because uh, they have one CP strat where you get to shoot your marker lights on a two-up and they get to move and uh, still do the action, which is very unlike a lot of the book. Um, on top of that, those marker lights go off on a two-up and you get to make a normal move. And so then this you can, get to shoot your opponent afterwards. So you could shoot them afterwards or you can get back into a devilfish uh, because you can't disembark and reembark in the same phase, but this is two totally different phases. You disembark yep. in the movement, you reembark in uh, the shooting phase. A normal move allows you to do that, um, even if it's not in the movement phase. Yep, so you can keep them safe turn after turn and just shoot reliable marker lights downrange, or you can use them to get extra distance to get in range of stuff and touch other objectives. It's a very solid unit. How I think about them is a breacher slash just a strike team that has special weapons. The special weapons are legitimately solid. You can get three ion rifles, they're five points each, or three rail rifles, five points each. The ion rifles are uh, three heavy three, so you really do need marker lights to hit to help offset that or take Monka. And the strength eight AP2 two damage can go to AP3 and co bad. with coordinate engagement. And so if you and bring three of those, and they reroll the ones that would otherwise kill them. Exactly. So that's nine shots of ion that can just come out and hit you. Yeah, it's, it's pretty good. Bad. Three rail rifles, they get mortals on when they successfully wound, and their strength eight AP4 flat three. It's not a bad profile. I found that I'd rather the ions, personally, the extra volume of fire. Interesting. Uh, other synergies here. They can take three special drones that no other units can. The recon drone, you pick a unit within 18, and it doesn't benefit from light cover for uh, your Pathfinder unit. That's command phase, or is that... Uh... I think that's at start of shooting. Interesting. Uh, it's on the data, the drone data sheet. Itself. Either way, it's good. It's something like that. And then you have the pulse accelerator, which gives your pulse weapons in this unit extra AP. So you go to AP 1, strength 5. After making getting out, firing marker lights, making another normal move, and you've moved 17 inches, and then you get to shoot your opponent. So now you're AP 1, ignore cover, and then coordinating engagement can bring you to AP 2, ignore cover. Yep. And what you can do is you can move your devilfish, get out, 10 so you move 22 and then you move again so 29 and you just shoot your opponent yep it's pretty good it's and you also have marker lights all over their entire army it's pretty solid um so 
I quite like this unit. It has a pregame move uh, if you're not embarked in the Devilfish. You can take a couple other upgrades that I think are, are less useful. But this unit's pretty solid. It, if you want to take a Breacher team that does actual long-range damage, upgrade to a Pathfinder team. That's how I think about it. Yeah, I, I think it's also if you're taking something where you just generally don't want to have a lot of Marker Lights, this unit will solve that for you at minimum for one turn. Yep. Right, you come out and you just are like, here's eight Marker Lights wherever I want. If you're playing the with the, the WTC ruling that you can advance and, and do finish the marker light action, I think you just do the marker lights in the crisis unit like I was. But if you are running, you playing Tau in an event that doesn't, I do actually like having a Pathfinder team. Yep. And uh, to answer a question from Tyrannosaurus Rex earlier, Fusion Collider or Cyclic Ion Raker, I think you can take both now. They're to they are soft, but the thing is, you're either putting the the Pathfinders back into the Devilfish out of line of sight. Or you're committing them to do a bunch of extra damage, and in that case, you're trading them. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's either or. You don't just step out there and hit the marker lights and then let the unit and die. Then, yeah. It's it's you either shoot and don't you either marker light and don't get shot back, or you. Here you go. You're going for damage. Yeah. Um, okay. Piranha. So I personally think that they're up here. I, I can see that. I think they're I, actually. They probably strong. wouldn't make any of my list because I'm going more aggro than I think than control because I'm more aggro than than you are. Yeah, um, but, in but control I see the, their value, hundred percent. Especially without that WTC ruling, I, I really quite like them. Yeah. Now I'm a huge fan of piranhas. All right, I so love piranhas. Let's let you uh, break down the piranha here. Okay, so the piranha I think is very good. So first off, it's sixty points, and uh, I believe it's an extra ten if you want the fusion. But it's hidden behind a couple. Yeah, it's an extra 10 if you want the fusion. Fusion's actually pretty good, though. So this thing moves 16 and is a tiny little profile. So it's really good for just hiding behind walls, uh, hiding uh, commanders off of if you want to do that. Um, it's very, very good at that. It also has a decent number of shots, right? It has four shots off of each of the drones. It has two of those, so eight shots at that. And six shots with the Piranha Burst Cannon, so that's 14 shots. It's good, I think, in um, Farsan Enclaves, because then you get, if you're within nine inches, you just get plus one to hit, and you just shoot your opponent with a billion shots that are all, you know, AP zero, but can be AP one with coordinated engagement. You might do that. You might not. Uh, it can hold a Seeker Missile, five points. You probably won't do that. You can, if you want. Generally, I think of these as skirmishers. They're tiny little models that just wedge themselves in walls or behind places or, you know, threaten to jump behind units and start shooting into vulnerable troop units or, or characters or things like that. I love them as just skirmishers, personally, and I think they're great in Farsight Enclaves. Um, and they're durable in their own way, right? So they're not quite as durable as a unit of stealth suits, but they are toughness six, which means that there some weapons just don't hurt them the same way that they hurt cell suits, and they're also cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, there's Piranha Fusion Blaster in Farsight Enclaves, or Tau Sept especially, because you can reroll the hit or the wound, rather than just the wound. Mm -hmm. It is an 18-inch range Fusion Blaster at plus two damage, because it's plus two normally and plus four when you're within, within nine inches. And that actually hits quite hard. Now, would I take that most of the time? No, but in Tau Sept, I would strongly consider it. Um, because then you can reroll. You miss the hit, fine. You miss you miss the wound, fine. Like you you reroll one of the two, uh, and in Farsight Enclaves, I could consider as well because you hit on a three, mm -hmm. and you get that reroll to wound. So it's just that much more reliable that you actually do damage to vehicles with it. Is this thing trying to get in fights with vehicles most of the time? Probably not. Probably trying to skirmish, be on objectives, be fast, and be a screen, which is something that it's very good at. What's your what are your thoughts? So. My favorite thing with piranhas, and this is the same for devilfish, is that on boards where there's a ruin like right off an objective, you can use the stratagem designated tasking to disembark the drones. Yes. And that rule says that the drones need to be disembarked within one inch. Not entirely in, not within, not uh, wholly within an inch, just within an inch, which means you put one model within an inch, two inch coherency, model. And you just get primary because it happens in your command phase and primary scored at end of the uh, command phase. Yeah. So you can literally just have a piranha hiding behind a ruin on WTC on like a small L right outside the objective. Nothing's on it. You're not trading anything away. Command phase, boom, drop the drones out. All of a sudden you get a 12 if it's a center objective or you just guarantee you get your eight without trading a unit. 
and it's awesome. Designated tasking is quite good. Yep. It is it's so quite a good strategy. Can, it's good on planes. It's good here. Like it's just good generally. And the one inch, you place them one inch away in uh, docked units. So this is uh, drones that are docked. Yep. And Piranha has two drones docked, which just gives it eight shots normally at eighteen inch range, which is quite strong. But it also gives it, uh, it, it it also gives it that ability to kick the drones off in in a very powerful way. I think. Yep. Okay, so I, I actually agree that uh, Piranhas are quite strong. They didn't make the cut because I went with Stealth Suits because I think they benefit even more from Borkon in being durable, and I like that they're core and can get the Feel No Pain if I need it. But uh, these guys are pretty solid. I think they're they're up here. Yep. Because they're also great. Jack didn't even talk about it. They're great move blockers. They can bump into things and hold them down, and uh, I think they do that job great. Yeah, yep, Absolutely. Your tech and designated tasking? Yeah, it says the models have to be set up within an inch, so I believe every model in the unit has to be set up within it because it, it references model by model. But that's something to ask your TO for sure because yeah. it's, it's a gray area. But also within an inch can be on the other side of a wall. Touching Absolutely, 100%. Yeah. You set it up with intent of being, you know, with the intent of being within an inch and then a base width of the objective, and it's yours. Yep, exactly. You just need to touch the very edge of the objective and done. So it's a, it's a cool trick uh, for Tal, yep. for that strat. But docked units uh, need to do that. Yep. All right, uh, we've got Vespid Stingwings. So these guys are, I believe, 60 points for five. I'll, I'll double check and, that. And uh, 72 for six, if it, you wanted to do retreat battlefield data. It's been a hot moment since we've taken them. Uh, uh, yep, 60 for five, uh, 72 for six. Okay, so... They're pretty cheap for what you get because they're a 14-inch moving unit. They have 4-up save, not particularly good. They're T4. Uh, they're not sept, so they don't benefit from any of the main tower rules, and they're auxiliaries, so they're not betting from marker lights. But they have a decent gun, 18-inch assault 2, strength 5, AP3, 2 damage. It's not bad. What they're really here for is mission playing stuff. It is being able to, since they're infantry, move 14 inches or come in natively from reserve and try and do like a refeat, uh, retreat battlefield data, you know, raise banners, airspace. Yep, they move 14, it's great. Yep. Moving fast is good. So they're very solid. Uh, they are competing with breacher teams and uh, pathfinders and the like, um, so you don't always see them, but I think that they're pretty solid, honestly. I think they're solid. I, I think I they, they suffer from, from comparisons, yep. and they suffer from not being able to get marker lights. God, if they were core and had marker lights or whatever, like imagine this was a Tau unit that had like a jump pack or whatever. Um <laughs> Yeah, it's a tell you. If it had it just... the if it had the profile, but was core and could benefit from stuff, it'd be insane. It'd be good. But because uh, then you get hitting on threes, real ones, strength five, AP three, damage two. It's great. I personally think that they're in here. Yeah, they're fine. They're mission play. They're 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 decent mission play. Not amazing, but fine. Yep. But let's talk about mission play that is um, amazing. Significantly we got, better. We got crude hounds. Okay, so these guys are six points a model. For four of them, you get twenty four points, which is an absolute steal. They move twelve inches. They have a pregame move. They hit on threes in combat, have three attacks that are uh, strength three, AP one, um, and they can access that six inch heroic intervention stratagem. They get an additional save uh, against ranged attacks when they're benefiting from cover. So the cool thing is like against, you know, chaos knights indirect or whatever it is, you have them touching cover. So they have a six up save plus one for benefiting from light cover and then plus an additional. So four up and then it's indirect fire. So they get a plus one from that. So they just sit on a three up against indirect fire that doesn't have AP. It's pretty solid. That's quite good into cast knights. For yep, sure. It really is. <laughs> and uh, they also reroll advance and charges. So you're like, okay, I need to move, you know, 15 inches to get to this objective. They move 12, a three up rerolling to get on there. Done. Yeah, I was saying having that same thing with Harlequin troops, I'd get them in cover and then I'd get a four up against them because I have a six up armor save. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> so back to the four ups. Back to four ups. So these guys are amazing. They're one of the cheapest, fastest move blocking screening units that you can possibly get. I, I, I always can't run at least. They haven't gone up. They're awesome. Yeah, they're just they're so good. favorites. They're they're now the favorite crew. <laughs> twenty four inch, uh, twenty four points for a twelve inch moving unit that pregame moves. So good. It's like one of the best screens Honestly, in the game. You can take a bigger unit and just move block all sorts of things on the board if you yep. wanted to, but most people just keep them cheap. Let's talk about broadsides. Okay, we got the broadsides. So moving into the heavy support here. Did they get core back? No. No, no. they didn't? No. No. The joke was that taking away core was a buff to Tau because then people would stop taking these things. Yeah. <laughs> so the reason that they are not good is because they're slow. Yeah, they're very slow. They benefit a lot from Marcus of Omen because they can start in strategic reserves and come in at an angle that's actually powerful. But they are just very slow. They benefit a lot when Monka was good because you would pick Monka, 
then they would advance and move up the table, still be able to shoot, advance again, move up, and get in a position where they can kind of hold down. Um, they're no longer core, so they don't benefit from pretty much all the relevant rules, which means they're pretty terrible. Uh, their guns are not bad. They can take a bunch of SMS shots. They can take the uh, heavy rail rifle, which is 60 inch range, heavy two, strength nine, AP four, flat three plus D three, and mortals on your wound rolls. They can auto wound with advanced targeting system, uh, auto wound on sixes, or they can get access to stabilized optics, which means they don't take the penalty for moving and yep. firing heavy weapons. And that one's free, so I'd probably take that. Yep. The issue here is they're just they're not that cheap. They don't benefit from all those same core rules, and they're just slow. Even when they come in at one angle, they shoot at that one angle. They move five inches. Yeah, it's very easy for a canny opponent to play around it, it's, which is kind of the issue. They're very they're much better on lighter boards, but on on the normal dense terrain that you see at the top tournaments, they're just not doing very yeah. much, in my opinion. I could see taking a couple of them on like two of them or something or or three individual ones on WTC boards just to help out against specific matchups. Like um, if you're taking Tau Sept or Farsight Enclaves and you get that reroll, they are all right against things like Knights where you just want to amp your damage because you need to just go like, I don't want this to be a 70% chance I kill you. I want this to be a 95% chance I kill you. Things like that. I can see it. Still probably wouldn't be able to find the points for it, if I'm being honest with you. But, it uh, just adds up too much. I could see taking one or two just to have that damage against particular targets. You can make them relatively durable in Borkon because they're minus one to incoming strength, and then they're two-up armor sitting in cover T6? for one-up. T5. T5? T5. T5. Eight Somehow wounds, they're not as tough as a Piranha. Ah, is... they're infantry, which I think is... Uh, yeah, it helps them. It helps them quite a lot. So I don't like broadsides. Didn't yep. like them when they were core. Really don't like them without core. That's fair. I uh, think it's I think it's top of firecast disappointment because at least they do like a they thing. can do damage. Yeah, yeah, but they're not <laughs> great. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't say right. so. Let's talk about something that you can actually talk about taking in a in a towel yep. list. So we got the old Riptide here. So it moves twelve inches, mm -hmm. and uh, that's pretty speedy profile. Its defense is very good. Two up save, four up invuln. And you can bring two shield drones, shielded missile drones, in the unit uh, so that you can use those as ablative. You can use a different drone as a savior protocol. So you can keep these al things alive even in the open. Now, their biggest benefit is they have long range, which a lot of Tau guns are kind of medium range. So the Ion Accelerator is the one that you most often see. And it's six shots, can go to eight if you uh, boost its uh, shooting profile. Strength eight, AP three, four damage. It's pretty Mortals good. on ones to hit uh, because it's an ion weapon. Um, the one ways to get rerolls are either Tau Sept or um, Farsight Enclaves. You can get a reroll to wound. And that's, and that's, that's pretty much it. It's pretty much it. I think with Armor of Contempt going away, you can actually have a conversation with a heavy burst cannon. It is, I believe, 10 points cheaper. And I think you can. there's maybe room for one of those in your list because... Armor Contempt went away. It does actually kill infantry yep, units it's now. It's 12 shots can go up to 16 now? Eight, uh, it used no, to it might be 16. Yeah, it's 16. It's they, 16. It used to go to 18. Yeah, this Strength thing just 16. ignores cover and just shoots and will reliably scoop a unit every turn, yep. pretty much. It gets three of the uh, upgrades, which is um, I usually take Target Lock Velocity Tracker for sure, and then it's either Multi Tracker or Early Warning Override. There's big Terminator bricks right now, so I often take the Multi Tracker for exploding six. Yeah, eight. I think Multi Tracker, Target Lock, Velocity Tracker is the standard. And then you can take SMS, you can take Plasma Rifles, any of that. Uh, the, yeah, I'm still on broadsides here. One of its uh, big benefits is this Nova Reactor. Yes. So uh, you roll 2d6. If the result's greater than the remaining wounds on the Riptide, you're burned out. So it starts at 14 wounds, which is great. But once you start losing moons, you could potentially lose your Nova Reactor. Um, now, what are the benefits? First of all, you can get a 5-up Funeral Pain, which means these guys can tank a lot of damage, even mortal wounds, yeah. out in the open in front of your Crisis Unit. They can move 2d6 in the charge phase. Yep, that's uh, very strong. They yep. peek out, just see the, the hair on your chin-chin-chin, shoot, and then pop back behind so cover every turn. they effectively have a Fire and Fade, although uh, not spending a Strat to do it. You're spending a, the Nova Reactor. Um, you can also just get them into annoying positions. You move them up, strike and fade the unit, and then move 2d6 to protect. What I've done is you were like using Sasea? teleport a cold star into an area that's vulnerable to get an angle on my opponent, move the Riptide, 
um, fire and fade it, uh, strike and fade it, and then move it 2d6 with the Nova Boost and stand in front of that Cold Star. That's pretty That's pretty yep. good. I know you like it in Sasea because you can run up with a durable unit, hold an objective in the open. Yeah, exactly. And also with a 5 of Film of Pain, it's like super durable. And then you can also just go boop, boop, take your objective. Yep, because you in Sasea, you can make it obsec uh, with the uh, Warlord trait from Sasea. Yeah, it's very strong. And then finally, that Nova Charge to boost the gun profiles. Yep, so... I, two, uh, is it 240 with the burst cannon, 250 with the ion? That is correct. Yep. Uh, the plasma rifles, the twin plasma rifles, are free. Mm -hmm. uh, the SMS costs 10 for two, and the uh, fusion blasters cost 20 for two. I personally just like the plasma rifles. Yep. Keep just it cheap. A little bit extra long-range firepower. I think one with a heavy burst cannon is totally fine, um, but generically people like taking the ion accelerators. They do tend to mortal wound themselves over time, but uh, if you're tau you can mitigate that. The heavy burst cannon doesn't do that. Yep. Um, I think the the Riptide is a very solid unit. I've been running yep. a lot of um, you know double, triple Riptide lists uh, in the past, and they perform fine. Their damage is inconsistent, especially the Ion Accelerator, because it's lower yep. volume of shots. And no rerolls to hit, no rerolls to wound. Maybe you get a reroll to hit or wound in there. Trust me, that's not reliable. It hits on a four base. Very easy to make it hit on a four, hit back on a four after Mark Light, or make it hit on a five. Um, yeah, that's the biggest thing is on boards that have a lot of dense cover or against opponents that have a lot of minuses to hit um, or a lot of invulnerable saves, these guys can do very little. I had a game possible, I played against yeah. Nick, which you're going to actually see uh, later in the week. Uh, we're going to release it from the War Room. It's a great game, super tight at the end. Um, uh, and I won't spoil the end, but it's worth it for your Tau fans. Check it out. The Riptides, I had three of them. I fired two commanders and a full unit of crisis suits, and then two uh, coordinated engagement pathfinder units, picked up 10 Scarab Occult Terminators. Three Riptides then shot at uh, Magnus and Fate Weaver and did four damage. Yep. I know that I played <laughs> my Harlequins into your Tau when you had triple Riptide, and your damage was so unreliable that it basically didn't do anything. Yep. And then your one unit of crisis suits was just like picking up double boat over and over again. It's a it's, lot more reliable with Crisis Suits, especially since you can stack rerolls to either hit or wound or ones to hit or ignore modifiers or whatever. Whereas Riptides, it's a lot more annoying to get them to a 3-up to hit, and it's a lot easier to drag them back to a 4 or a 5. Because Tau don't have a great defensive secondary plan, they're one of them, they're going to have to get aggressive and do something. They can take banners and decisive action, but then you have to do something to get the, other, the third one. Um... Yeah, sitting there and striking and fading or Nova boosting your Riptides, yes, that's cool into other armies with a lot of firepower, but it's not going to win you games against the hard opponents that can outplay you on the mission. Yep. And that's what I, that's why I moved away from Riptides. Being able to move quickly is quite nice. Like you move 12, shoot, fire, strike and fade forward into a ruin and then the following turn threaten to go forward. Like Riptides are good. Yep. They're unreliable and I, I don't... I don't know how much I like the triple Riptide. It tries to solve the reliability issue by just having three of them, which is something people do with Hammerheads, and it's probably the only way I would run Hammerheads. Um, but I, I just, at that point, you're precluded from taking Crisis Suits just because of the points. And uh, I like one of these. It's not bad. It can strike and fade. Your Crisis Suits can strike and fade. Like, you still have that game plan. But yeah, they are unreliable. Yep. I like them in Borkon as a, that durability. I actually just give them the five of Fino Pain, forget about their damage, and I just shove them up. And um, triple Riptide, Crisis Unit, the double Commander, that's a lot of beef to yep. deal with. It's something you can reliably put on an objective and just say, this will probably be here come next turn, which is not something Tau usually has. Yep. I like them in Sasea because, like you said, you can make them obsec and move them really far. I think they're up here. I think they are. You just need to know their limitations when you build your list, but they are solid. They're tough. They're very durable. They are very durable, and that's something Tau don't have. Yeah, when I experimented with like a triple tide build that didn't run Crisis Suits and just had a lot of other stuff, no, they, you don't have reliable damage outside commanders. Yeah, so. that that would be my my take. But you know, um, Andrew Gagno has been doing very well with a triple triple Riptide list that started out as a bit of a meme, and he's like, wait a minute, this is actually pretty good. Um, it's just you you just don't have reliable damage. Yeah, up in the he same would just line. run into a matchup where now it's Riptides aren't consistent and. Oh, um, that's a shame. Flipping coins. Uh, yeah. It also worked much better, in my opinion, when you could run three cold stars because these guys would get into the spot to block them off, and yes. then you'd have the planes. And it's just, I think they don't work quite as well. Triple tie doesn't work quite as well in this meta. You can run it, but it's inconsistent, and it can't be your main damage. It, it definitely got worse when you can't take like three cold stars and an enforcer. Yep. Yeah. All right, we got red red drum redrum. 
Red Drum, I think. Thank you so much for your three months uh, as a War Room member. Really appreciate your continued support. Hey guys, will you do some videos or reactions on the stuff that GW revealed today and in the last few days? They just showed the complete Terminator's data sheet. What's the next masterclass? So I, I didn't check out that article. I've been focused on Tau. Yeah. But uh, we'll definitely be talking about, you know, 10th edition when we get some actual, you know, um, you know, like real meat to the rules. Um, and hopefully, we'll probably do what we ended up doing uh, towards the tail end of 8th edition into 9th, which is once we get full rules, we'll just start adopting them into our games and getting used to them. But uh, for now, um, you, the next Masterclass, I believe Matt Robertson is doing Sisters. I don't know off the I top of my head. I believe Matt Robertson is doing Sisters is the next one. So, But uh, I'll definitely confirm that. If you yeah, go ahead me, and tag I'll, me in I'll the Discord. I'll look it up now. Okay. Let's move on to the Hammerhead Gunship. Mr. Jack, this is one that you have yeah. been uh, desperately waiting for. I already mentioned it. Oh, yeah. Love it. Love if it. If you watch the Streamhouse RTT... The hammerhead is still, can confirm, still very inconsistent. Now, I didn't take him for doing damage with the railgun. That's just a bonus if it happens, because I don't expect it. Uh, what I actually take him for is being able to do the submunition strat to do mortal wounds against large units. Especially like bricks, pink GSC. horrors, as you were saying, or pink something horrors, that's very like, scary. That can be annoying, uh, annoying obsec units, big bulky units that don't like mortal wounds. Submunitions is actually good, so it's a tech choice. It's good in enemy crisis bricks, for sure. Yep, well, if you can see them, if, which you're not going to be. So. Well, it depends if they're going to be, like, they would like to be able to be out in the open and, and bring shots in. Right, like a big in crisis. The Tal matchup? I think in a in the Tau Mirror matchup, if you take like the the big crisis unit, you want to try to get your opponent to shoot at your toughest target, so then you can pick up all of their weak stuff. And the hammerhead means they can't do that because you're just like, here is eight mortal wounds right off the jump, like before we get to any any other part of the shooting phase. Um, so it helps there, but it really does help against Katari. It really helps against um, pink against pink cars, that sort of thing. Is the hammerhead bad? No. It is deeply inconsistent. The railgun is basically the only thing you're going to take, and it's a one-shot gun. Hits on a four base. It's not really worth spending a mark light to improve the odds of hitting one die roll, but you're going to do it because it's so brutal when you miss it. Hits on a four base. It rerolls its hit roll natively. You would only ever take this in a sept where you get a reroll on the wound roll as well, which would be Tau Sept or Far Sept Enclaves. You had one in your list, which you could use a CP reroll on the wound, and it's fine, but it's mostly for submunitions. Yep. Um, hammerheads are fine. They're fine. The main issue Said is... with deep regret. <laughs> the main issue is they just... I don't understand it. They just don't hit. They just don't. They don't. They don't hit. And when they don't... When they hit, they don't wound sometimes. It's obnoxious. Now, yes, it's AP six, and they, you know, they don't get invulns, and it's a lot of damage, and they take mortal wounds, and it's generically good against a lot of stuff. But you basically have to make every turn's plan because you you figure out what your turn is going to do ahead of time, and then you move and execute. And when you make your plans, you have to account for this unit doing nothing, like like nothing, because if you don't hit your shot. It's basically what it does. You have the accelerator bursts. The accelerator bursts are quite good, right? 16 shots at 611. That's solid, but that's close range. Probably not where these things want to operate. They're, they're pretty solid in Borkon at 22, where yes. you can keep the hammerhead safe. But if you're throwing the hammerhead in the middle of the table, it's going to die. And uh, your units better not be around because it explodes for D6 mortals on a 6. And it yeah. always explodes. It always explodes. It explodes fully half the time. I don't understand it. So... You just have to plan your turn like it doesn't do anything. And when it does its job, you're like, oh, my God, thank you. Oh, oof. Like, every time I shoot these, it's just miserable because you're like, please just work. Okay, all right, you worked. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And the following just like, please just hit. Oh, okay, cool, you hit. Thank you. Please just hit. Oh, you missed. Oh, no. Oh, my turn is about to swing way under. Yeah. So relying on that railgun to actually do anything is just a fool's errand, in my opinion. I think Jack has experienced the same thing. The submunition strat is very good because it is not an attack, and so pink horrors can't come back against it. Yes. Now, the one time... So long strike is fundamentally different. He has reasons to include him outside of it. And he also has plus one to hit and plus one wound, which comes up against toughness eight targets. Yep. Um, so long strike, amazing. Hammerhead, fine fine because i can't i can't say it doesn't do damage it does but like Not it's a nightmare for you across a tournament like it's just miserable to play 
if you take four of them, right, long strike and three guys, then you get to a point where you do damage fairly reliably. So it's all right, but you put so many points into hammerheads, I'm not a huge fan of it. But that's the way I would run them. I would run them as four hammerheads just taking shots from in across a team the board. environment in a team's environment it also really scares some armies yeah they also hammerheads are very bad in the demons matchup which is outside of pink horrors outside of killing their troops against the big monsters because they don't ignore demonic invulnerability. yeah they're actually pretty good anti-infantry in the demons matchup because you have those accelerator bursts uh so they have to get a little more aggressive and they're less risk of just dying because your demons don't really have shooting but yeah, the fact they don't ignore invulns means you basically don't fire the main gun as anything other than three mortal wounds. Are we going to hilariously put them in reliable rank and file as an unreliable unit? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we are. Realistically, on its profile, it should be here. But in practice, it is down here. Yeah, it's it can let you down. And when it lets you down, it's horrible. Yep. Like It's terrible for your game plan when it lets you down. The average is great, but you don't look at average you look at what it like when it fails to live up to average it'll never be average right it'll either be above average great or occasionally your your turn just like hits a spiral because this thing just didn't connect and so the average is deceptive the average should be solidly promotion to shots maybe may be Shazel's favorites but that's not how it works because when it lets you down it is so bad Okay, moving on to the Sky Ray a gunship. So the Sky Ray is similar to a hammer, Hammerhead defensively, uh, but what it gets is aerial scanners. So each time the unit's gunship uh, model makes a ranged attack against aircraft, you get plus two to hit and reroll the damage, which the damage on a secret missile is uh, strength nine, AP three, two D three. Um, it has a seeker missile rack instead of individual seekers now. So instead of having a bunch of once per game shots like it used to have, it has a consistent number of um, seeker missile rack shots. Heavy D3 plus one, so minimum two, up to four. It's still not great, but it's okay. And strength nine, AP3, 2D3, uh, 2D3 damage. It gets a reroll to hit, which is cool. It has uh, drones docked on board, um, if you want it, or the accelerator burst, probably. And uh, it also explodes four D6 mortals on a six. I It has access to a stratagem where you can shoot the missiles out of line of sight. Um, the secret missiles. Fine, then your ballistic skill it five. Used, that used to be stronger. Um, it can work if you have pathfinders or you have um, what you call it, the uh, uh, tetras to go get markalites behind. Then you hit back on there. fours. I'm still not with a reroll. Yeah. I I am not a huge fan. I believe his name is James McKenzie has been running one in his Borcon list. Too know. good effect on the West Coast. Um, probably works better on player place terrain where there's just less terrain in general. Um, but I am not a huge fan of it. I think I would rather have a hammerhead before it, <laughs> frankly. Yeah, it sounds about right. Uh, yeah. But if aircraft ever came back in a big way, it does have good anti-aircraft rules. Plus two to hit and reroll damage against them. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Skyrays are 135. They're also pretty dirt cheap. They're pretty and they cheap. come with two marker lights. So yeah, if aircraft were a big thing, I could see it. Because they deep strike the aircraft down, and you're like, all right, you're gone. Bye-bye. I honestly think it's fine. It's like, fine. if you wanted to run it. 135, it's a solid profile. It's here-ish. Where do you want to put it? Uh, I think reliable rank and file. 135, it's got a decent profile. Yeah. Uh, and you might be saying, why take this before broadsides? Broadsides are just so slow. At least this thing can be fast. This thing moves 12. Like, that's that's big. <laughs> that, that's it. You that's gotta that's move it on, right there. On the big terrain boards, you got to move. You got to be able to move. All right, we're into dedicated transports for one, you know, All profile. right, the Devilfish... Is 95 points. It comes with two gun drones. I don't really ever upgrade its uh, guns to SMS or anything. You can give it accelerator burst, right? Uh, no, it has an accelerator burst as its main gun. It can I take see. the two gun drones or smart missiles. If Got it. Take I... accelerator burst. I would like it even more. Yeah, I saw accelerator burst and I was like, wait a minute. It has just no. one at the center, uh, bottom center. Yeah. So it can hold 12 sept infantry or drones. And uh, like I said, it can have those two gun drones and do designated tasking, which is really cool. Uh, it can hold the full Pathfinder unit because the Recon Drone gets a special spot up on the top. Oh, that's nice. Um, it's 13 wounds, T7, 3-up saves, so it's relatively durable. And the cool things here are stratagem support and its data sheet. So if you pick Moncot, it gets a 9-inch pregame move. If you pick Kalyon, it can go back into reserve. Cool. Solid. Its stratagem is very good. It's 1 CP, you pick up to 3 Devilfish, and you decide... Uh, based on whether you chose Kalyan or Monka, whether um, 
uh, which turns you get to move the devilfish, normal move it, and then disembark a troop unit, which then gets to move and touch objectives and stuff. So in Monka, in that devilfish uh, rush, you can just pregame move them nine, and then, okay, you pick Monka, so in the first three turns, you can select up to three devilfish, and now they make their normal move on turn one. They disembark the breachers, who then walk out and uh, start shooting stuff. So it's pretty strong there. Um, that's a this is a good strat. They also have a strat where uh, they can give reroll ones to fire warriors, I believe, that are nearby them, which is okay. Uh, the biggest thing for me is it's a transport that's relatively durable enough that your opponent has to commit something real to kill it, and then Obsec can pop out into different annoying places. That's how I use it, really. You can yeah. also soak mortal wounds quite effectively with 13 wounds. Yeah. I, Devilfish, honestly, at 95 make rhinos look really silly at 80. So for that reason, I think it's promotion to Chazelle. I think it's just a solid transport. It's just a solid transport, synergizes well with the infantry here. All right. You want to talk about something that's a complete and utter joke? Okay, we are gonna we got our first scapegoat for Anva's death, I think. Yeah, I think it's it's so bad. Okay, here we go. It's called the Razor Shark Strike Fighter. You may have never heard of it because I don't, I've never seen it on the table. What it has is, this is supposed to be the fighter jet. You know, like a lot yeah, of Yeah, this should have more guns, right? So it's... It's T7, so it's one more toughness than the Sunshark Bomber, and uh, 12 wounds, 4 up saves, still terrible there. Uh, it has an Accelerator Burst Cannon, whereas Hammerheads and Sky Rays have two of them, so it's one of these 8-shot Strength 6 AP1. It's got a Quad Ion Turret, which is Assault 8, uh, and it's basically a Cyclic Ion Blaster, but just 8 shots, but it's all together as a single thing, so it can't split fire like the bomber. Cannot. And the bomber has 12 shots, this has 8. This has 8. And then it has uh, two seeker missiles. No missile pods, no free missile... Oh, it can take one missile. Oh, it can replace the accelerated burst with one missile pod. So Interesting. It doesn't come with a missile pod and doesn't get a free one and like the bomber. And you probably do want to replace with a missile pod? It probably costs points, it's right? Free, it's free, it's free. It's free, okay. I just checked. All right. Yep, so you get the quad ion turret, an accelerated burst, or missile pod, and two seeker missiles. And that's it. And how many points is it? 155? 155. So it's 10 points cheaper than the Sun Shark. You get one fewer missile pod, four fewer ion shots, the same number of Seeker missiles, but you get uh, no not bombing. having the bombing. Yep. <laughs> For 10 fewer points, that's what you get. Four fewer ion shots, two fewer missile pod shots, no bombs. Incredible. This is the Strike Fighter. And the reason, so this should have just way more guns on it. But it doesn't because that's how the people who designed the kit made it. If we switched the guns on them, then I can see it. You get the bombs, fewer guns. Fewer guns, no bombs is incredible. This is terrible. There's no reason to ever run it. Yeah, yeah. Sanok says, so to be clear, this is an interceptor aircraft that loses a gun duel with the bombers? Yes. Yes, that's what we're saying. Yep. It's uh, it's pretty incredible, actually. I honestly so. blame it for Anva's death myself. Yeah, it's pretty bad. If they were better, Anva would not have died. All right, Sunshark Bomber. This was straight up Shazo's favorites before uh, because... Still could be. Still could be. So it, it is a great fire support platform. It can do bombs, so mortals in the movement phase, which is very good against phase cap units. No longer bombs and flies off the table. Sad. Cannot bomb and fly off the table and also has to start in reserves. So comes down at the earliest turn two and then can only bomb by turn three at the yes. earliest. All right, so, but it does have, like we said, those 12 ion shots, four missile pod shots, and two seeker missiles, which is very solid, and also has a marker light on top of that. Okay. Uh, there are 165 points. I think that in Farsight Enclaves, I still like them quite a bit. Yep. And in Borkon, with that extra defense, it actually makes them annoying to kill. It does. It Outside made it annoying that, for me to kill, for sure. I don't really like them anymore. Uh, I think they're fine. I think they're fine. I agree that I probably wouldn't take them in Tau Sept. Uh, but I still might. They're they're a lot worse when they don't have that free marker light on turn three when you go in. Um, and in Borkon, they are significantly more durable against toughness six or uh, against strength seven or strength six. So that is quite nice. Um, that being said, they're still probably the most efficient damaging platform in the book. Don't. And by being forced to put them into reserves, you're basically simulating what would have happened every time you went second where you put them into reserves. So it's not the biggest deal, right? They would come down turn two, shoot, fly over, bomb, shoot. So I think there's still most of their effectiveness, but they have lost some options, being able to yep. fly over turn one and use marker lights turn one, shoot them turn one, bomb turn one, crucially. So yeah, I, I can see, I can see, I think pro dropping to promotion to Shazelle is totally fine. Yep, I agree. Uh, the other thing is that 
they aren't they still aren't that consistent they can swing even though they have decent volume of fire they can do underperform especially against minus one day. yeah that's where far side enclaves i think comes in you get that uh marker light you drop them all the way in the back uh, make sure you have a drone nearby so you can save your protocol like a big long range shot and then you fly over and you start picking away things that are behind walls i think they're quite good I think they're up in the middle of the tier, although we haven't yeah, really been ranking. Really. We haven't been ranking them by yeah. where anything goes. All right, let's. Uh, okay, we got a couple oh God. fortifications. Oh, we're tide wall, shield wall. Okay, I'm tide, gonna I'm gonna do this very simply. Tide wall, shield line, drone port, and <laughs> gun rig. Take a devil fish. <laughs> yeah, just don't just don't do that. So here they are. I am just going to, yep, uh, they're just over there, over there, and over there. Okay, there you go. There's the three of them. They're all terrible. Ew. All right, moving Take on. Take a devilfish. Storm surge. Please. Storm surge. This when it came out was I think was a three hundred something. It was three thirty. It's three thirty. It's three thirty. It's got a lot of good guns. Um, the biggest problem is its mobility. It only moves eight, but it was helped by the fact that Monka was the way to play, and so you could advance and just move it up the board and get into angles. Yeah, there was also a very silly um, ruling at one point in FLG events where you could advance, drop the anchors, and shoot, and it was a little ridiculous. Uh, that's just not how the rule works. Yep. So, because you fail the action, if, you fail the actions if you advance. Um, well, they were counting with Monka that. You counted to stationary, so didn't count as moving. So anyway, there's a lot of complex things with that. Hopefully, that's resolved in tenth edition because it still is a problem. Yeah, like people debating it just... uh, whether you can move and do actions if you're counting as stationary. Um, so, in terms of what it brings, it's got uh, a bunch of low AP volume of fire shots, depending on which weapons you take, and then you can take either the pulse blast cannon, which is shorter range um, but high damage. So it's literally. 24 shot, heavy 2, strength 16, AP 4, 12 damage, <laughs> which is hilarious. It's a lot of damage. Or 48 inch range, uh, 6 shots, strength 12, AP 2 for some reason, 4 damage though. Or you could take the pulse driver cannon, 72 inch range, 3d3 shots, strength 10, AP 4, 3 damage, blast. So usually you see the pulse blast cannon um, when, you, when you saw this unit. But uh, frankly, the damage in the game has continued to go up, and with guard and... and those type of armies and Votan in the meta, it's just not great. Yeah, the jump from 330 to 400 is what killed it for me. Because it used to be you could have three of these and an army behind it, and now you can have three of these and, like, nah. Especially with the points up increases to the rest of your army, no, you just can't. And also, you can't really include one of these and it does anything because it's so immobile and Tau has to root your opponent out. So I just don't love Storm Surges. I think Firecast Disappointment feels pretty... It's uh, a pretty, dis pretty disappointing data sheet. Yep. <laughs> All right, Jack. So that's the Codex. Uh, we are doing the Forge World ones, but it's going to be quick, I promise. Yeah, we do. Uh, we have spent... A deserved amount of time on the rest of the book and i think that all of the quite frankly garbage in this book uh, <laughs> deserves to go away so shasso rally does not have a lot of damage fires two shots at damage two thank you very much uh that is scapegoat for anva's death for sure <laughs> we have hazard battle suits that are i don't know how expensive they are probably too expensive hazard they're 60 points there's 60 points a model for the twin bursts and they're minus two to charge, which is dope, but it doesn't... It might but, actually stack, because I think it calls out specifically that it doesn't stack with specific things. Or no, it just doesn't stack with anything. doesn't stack with anything. So Any they're minus one. two to charge generally, which is decent. I think they fall into Firecast Disappointment, just because they are minus two to charge, and you can take one man's and uh, one around. I do agree that they're okay there. This yeah. next data sheet is actually solid, though. The Tetras, you get two to four of them, um, and they move quite quickly. And how expensive are they? Uh, it's 40 points per model, so 80 for two of them. That's not terrible. And they get a high-intensity marker light, which I don't know what it... Oh, it's, it's just th a three-shot three marker, shot marker light. Three-shot marker light. So uh, that's six. That's decent. Yep. That's decent. I could see Firecast Disappointment for him. Yep. This is not bad. Um, in Borkon, you get the minus one strength, but it, it's okay, because they are actually fast enough to get angles on things. Yep. Uh, then we've got the Yavara, which is just an embarrassment of low AP. <laughs> Um, it's big gun is it AP good. one and it's other big gun is damage one AP two. It they used to be thing, flat three damage all over the place. This thing is 320, uh, no, the Yavar is 300 flat and is just, mm, boy, does that not do any damage at all at all. <laughs> it used to be a Incredible. powerhouse of a unit. Incredible. And the, uh, the Ravarna. 
Where's the Ravarna? It should be. There we go. Yep. So the Pulse Submunitions Cannon, its big gun is damage 2 and 9 shots. Don't love it. Um, so that's... And you have to overcharge to get uh, 9 shots. Otherwise, it's 3d3, which is an average of 6. For something that is, checks notes, 320 points, <laughs> it's embarrassing, honestly. The damage output on this thing. The next unit used to actually be good. It was one of my favorite things to run in the Index Tau book. Uh, and then they created the aircraft rule, which ruined this unit. Also, Sun Sharks fill that slot because you can take up to two aircraft and that's it. Well, that's what I'm saying is you used to be able to take multiple units of these with multiple models. Yep. And they could score engage and be really durable and block charges. And they're good profile and, and reasonably costed for that. And then you can only take two individual models. Games Workshop, why? Two units is what you want. I want two units of them. Yeah, yeah two yeah, three-man no, 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 units. Fair, yeah. fair. I'm saying that's the distinction here. Two models, just yeah. make it two units of aircraft. And then the Remoras. And they just have better. refused to do so, so they are trash now. All right. Barracuda is an infinite amount of points, and therefore do not love them. Uh, the Barracuda is 235 points for toughness 7, 14 wounds, and a 3 up. Uh, that's pretty not great. Tire Shark is similarly costed. No, no, sorry. It's not 375. That's pretty expensive. Um, so there's two types of tiger sharks. I'm not going to try and distinguish between them. They're <laughs> bad. Um, then there's the manta, which is 60 wounds and dope, and also your entire army, <laughs> um, 2,000 points. The Townar supremacy armor, same deal. I believe it's a thousand. It, it was good in the index, and then they raised its points. Yeah, sad. Uh, and then whatever that ethereal is, I'm sure he's also bad. It was just an extra model that was on here. <laughs> All right. So do you want to move around the uh, the graphics that we have there, so that they're not. Uh, it's not the biggest deal. You get where everything is. It's they're, yep. They're just not in good places. So those are. There's a lot of. The, unfortunately, Games Workshop has just not come back to the Forge World rules and just let them exist it as is. And the Tau ones are terrible. Pretty much all of the Forge World Most options are terrible. Like the Space Marine one was basically the same thing of just going through the book and being like, this one's awful, and this one's awful, and this one's awful, and this one's it's awful. It's unfortunate because Eighth Edition Tau had some really cool synergies with the Forge World units, and Ninth Edition was like, don't play those models. And that's unfortunate because they're very cool. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully they get more love in 10th edition because they used to be actually cool and interesting. Yeah, the only good Forge World units that are coming to my mind right now are Custodes. And like maybe Thunderers for something like that in Guard. But the yeah. Custodes Forge World's like everything else yep. in here is garbage. <laughs> All right, so that is our tier list. Let us know what you think of it in the comments below. Um, give us a like, tell your friends about the channel, please subscribe to the channel. And if you want, uh, it's not more content like this, we do this mostly on the Freeview YouTube stuff, but if you want more in-depth content on Tau, like my Streamhouse RTT uh, post-match post, uh, post -match analysis, as well as all the other stream games I've played with Tau, go ahead and check out the war room below, thewarroom.vkchecks.tv. It's in the, the first link below. Now, we have a $10 super chat here from Mr. Shell. Morning, boys. Unrelated question. What are your thoughts on Votan lists that are taking 18 bikes? Think it's viable. Seen some take 15 hearth guards. Seen some success. I have tried out 18 bikes multiple times. I do not think it is the way. They just die. It's a four-up save. It's, it's, much, it's much better in teams, I think, where you can threaten that. But I think in singles, it's uh, inconsistent. Yep. I prefer the three mans. And then 15 hearth guard. You can run a brick of 10 and a brick of 5. Um, or a brick of eight and brick of seven, and have two of them. It's a lot of points, but I do I do like having at least one hearth guard unit. Yep. Yep. Uh, so thanks so much for your support. And if you want to find out more about Votan, we have a. Uh, I believe you are a member, but if you are not, there's a three day free trial down in the link below, and you can uh, try out the war room, see what you think. Yep. It's right in that link below, theworm.vhx.tv. It's free to try it out. It's three days. It's tons of content to watch, and more every single week. But uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Like I said, uh, please give us a like. Uh, tell us what you think about our tier list here. And honestly, I think in the broad perspective, Tower in a pretty decent spot overall in the game, even though they're kind of sitting around, what, like 44 46% win rate. They're, uh, I don't know. Tower has always had a low win rate for their power. Because yeah. I think Tower are a good army right now. It's it's a precise positioning uh, positioning army. If you start messing up in positioning, you lose games with this yeah. army. Yeah, you also, if you mess up tempo, you need to go kill your opponent in order to get your points. But do it in the careful way. Yeah, well, you need to do it in a careful way, but you also need to push the pace. Like, you need to push the pace. And if you sit back, you are going to lose the game. Yep. 
And so uh, I think overall Tau have a pretty nice mix. I just think that because the core buffs are almost all targeted towards crisis units, they still benefit the most from the synergies in this book. And I would like to see, hopefully in 10th edition, those synergies get broadened out a bit more to uh, help out some of these units. Absolutely. Well, I, uh, I think that's it for us for today. Uh, please let us know what you think in the Discord. Uh, if you are a member, if you're not a member, check out that free three-day trial mm -hmm. of the War Room. And uh, we will see you next time. Thank you, Mr. Jack. Thank you, Siegs. So long, everybody.